Each and every day, enjoy the Simple Six menu at Subway. An entire made-for-you meal featuring one of six six-inch sandwiches like the Italian BMT or Black Forest Ham. With any bag of chips and a 21-ounce drink, all for only $6. Subway. Eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Back at All-Star Week in New York City, the great Penny Hardaway. How are you? Great. Oh, no, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> you said you lived in Memphis, or you live in Memphis. Yes. And I was saying how if Memphis makes the Western Finals or the Finals, I want to do a Grantland Basketball Hour from Gus's Fried Chicken. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. On location, as long as inside. I'm awesome. You're there. You'll stop by. Yes, for sure. They would Gus's, do that, though, you right? You can't turn Gus's down. They would do that, they would though, do right? That. Yes. See, my, my fear is the smell of chicken... <laughs> would just rattle Jalen to the point where he wouldn't be coherent for the entire show. He's just like, where is it? Where are we doing Gus's? Where is it? <laughs> no, Gus's is, is, is great. Um, explain how much this Grizzlies team means to Memphis. Because it really seems like it's become part of the fabric. Of yeah, it the has, city. because it's definitely, it's, it's always been a college town with the University of Memphis. But over the years, they've been wearing on the fans, and now it's, it's pretty much the Grizzlies town. I right. mean, the, the core guys, Zach, Mike, and Mark, have, and Tony, have really done great by, you know, pushing the team in the right direction and then adding the pieces, Vince Carter, uh, Courtney Lee, yeah. Jeff Green, has, has pushed it over the, over the top. You have a, a small ownership stake, right? Yeah. Yeah, a couple yeah. percent? Yeah, yeah. You I'm, got I'm, in there early. That was yeah, a nice little absolutely, investment. right? I saw what was happening, and, uh, yeah. and you know, I'm just thankful for, um, for ownership for allowing me to be involved because being a hometown kid, that's just a dream to be a part of, of, a, yeah. great, of a team personally and, and now a great team. You're in there... Peyton Manning's wife is involved. Isn't Timberlake's in there yeah, a little Justin bit? Yeah, Justin Timberlake. It's, a, it's like kind of a quietly exciting ownership group. It is, and we're all excited right now. Yeah. yeah. I, I think they're going to... I said when they made the Jeff Green trade, even before they made it, I was like, they get Jeff Green, they're making the finals. Yeah, I said um, the same thing. Because the things that he does... And also, I, I'm a Celtic fan, so I watch him. I just felt like he's one of those guys. He should be like a fourth, fifth guy. You don't want him to be the guy. But if he's there and he can like be hit or miss and all of a sudden have the game where he scores 27 points or another game where he scores four points but he makes one big three, that's who he is. Yeah, yeah, and he's, he's definitely well, was the, the last position that I think that the Grizzlies needed because, like you said, he can fit right in with that crew. And yeah. As you can see, they welcomed, with, welcomed him with open arms, and he's coming in. Like you said, if he doesn't have 20, the team still wins. If he has 27 on that night, right. you, know, you don't need him for, for 20 a night. He can go. You can go small ball with him if Zebo's in at foul the four trouble. And he's at, yeah. yeah he can you could. tell everybody how ridiculous it is when people throw Marcus Gasol into the 2015 free agent conversation? Oh my God! No, I, there's a zero percent chance he's leaving. I he think grew it's up zero. In Memphis. I think it's zero. I mean, he went to high school there. He's been there a while. He loves, he loves the fans. It there. The fans love him. It would shock me if anything else happened beside him staying. There's no way he leaves. No, I don't think so. And the coach turned out to be a really good coach. Yeah, Coach Yeager's done a great job. I mean, you know, we got a lot of flack in the city for uh, Coach Hollins, who we yeah. all love, yeah. who is still a personal friend of mine. And uh, Coach Yeager understood the process of what was going on, and uh, he won the fans over. Because at first it was it was not nice because, right. you know, but that's the way it goes when the fans fall in love with a coach. And now that he's there, he's done an unbelievable job. How much of the success of the Grizzlies is attributed to um, just having former Celtics on the team? I know you're it's a Celtics like, fan. It's like 25% of the Celtics team. Fan. We should get a ring. You got, we Chris gave you Wallace Courtney, we gave you Tony. Boston, yeah. And he has that affiliation. I understand what you're saying, but I think it's a Memphis thing. I mean, you're right. Okay. They have some I, guys feel, that played in Boston. Yeah. I feel but, that's why I'm on the bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> the crowd's been great. The crowd's are Super great crowd. Come out and support. I mean, yeah. we're... We used to be, like I said, an all-college crowd, but now it's more, more fans than the Grizzlies games. I mean, they really are supporting the team, and uh, the team is responding to that. Have you ever hung out with Zebo? Yeah, Zebo is, uh, is a good friend of mine. Have you ever hung out, hung out with him? Zebo is a great guy, man. Zebo is one of the most soft-spoken, mild-mannered guys off the court, but on the court, he's a beast. What's your favorite Zebo story? You that, he just, the, the biggest thing about Zebo is that how caring he is in the city. Yeah. He gives so much money, so, helps so many different people in uh in, the, in the, the city of Memphis, and that's what I really appreciate about he and Tony. Those guys came right in, like, giving money away and, uh, to the city where, where it's definitely needed, and I, and right. I appreciate that. Give me an example of uh, the kind of things they do. Christmas, they go, actually, they go shopping with the people. 
Yeah. No, they don't just give money and say, hey, take this and go shopping. They take the people shopping themselves. It's more personable for them. I mean, they really enjoy uh, seeing a smile on someone's face who probably wouldn't have a great Christmas yeah. or who wouldn't have a great Thanksgiving. And uh, they, they, I mean, that's, that's what I really applaud them for. We're working on a, a big Grantland oral history about the magic in the, the mid-90s and that whole era that I think is going up in April, written by Jonathan Abrams, and we interviewed you for it. Um, you guys had this moment, this window, and I would say it was about two years mm -hmm. where you were the next team. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was gone. Yeah. And when you see, when you see a team like the Grizzlies or you see a team like the Thunder, I think is another good example. Like, do you, do you, ever, do you think some of these teams take the window for granted? I think so. I think, um, you know, really the Oklahoma City Thunder because of uh, KD and, uh, and Russell. Yeah. Was kind of like on the same status of Shaq and I. You know, we had the world in our palm. We had we were playing really good basketball. We were young, and uh, I don't think either one of us understood the moment. Yeah, I think we were just playing, and I think that's what I see in KD. And um, even though they've gone to the finals, yeah, and uh, they've gone to Western Conference Finals, uh, I think KD understands, or he's he has more pressure than Russell. Russell's just to me is just a free spirit out there just playing basketball. I think yeah. KD's feeling the pressure because of. The future free agency and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, the future stuff. free yeah. agency and all of that. So these other guys are winning championships, and it starts to, to weigh on him a little bit more, I think. So if you if you think back to Orlando, like what? give me one thing that you would just do differently if you knew then what you know now. I, that I would have just, you know, really tried to recruit Shaq more not to leave. Yeah. I think I was kind of, like I said, I was so young. At first, I didn't know he was leaving. I mean, he yeah. signed without me knowing, but... I would have definitely did more begging. You lose yeah. somebody that dominant. I mean, I didn't know. I was in the Olympic Games, and they announced it, and I was like, wow, he left. And I really yeah. didn't know the magnitude of it at that point until the following year, and I was like, wow. Right. I mean, Wow, just Shaq, last 29 man. points and 14 on, rebounds man. a game. And um, I would have definitely been closer with him and saying, look, we have to do this together. Yeah. Don't leave. And I don't think that we appreciated Shaq enough in Orlando. And I think the fans, because back then... It was a big deal about his free throw shooting. How could we ever win a championship because Shaq can't make free throws? They're going to foul him at the end of the game. We're going to lose. And that's what the fans were really putting in the papers when he was a free agent. And that wasn't, that wasn't good. And I think that helped him leave the goals to the Lakers. Also, I think when, when Hakeem did so well in the finals against him, all of a sudden people were like, well, you know, he's not even the best. Like, it just seemed like people were just looking for cases to make that you guys lost to the Bulls in 96. Although, like... I, I the Bulls probably win that series. That was a great Bulls team, but you had bad luck in that series. Yeah. Like, didn't Horace Grant get hurt in game Horace one? Horace got hurt. A lot of guys got Somebody injured. Somebody else got hurt in game Shaq three. Shaq was injured. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, we were fighting an uphill battle with the Bulls. They were already great, and then we weren't at full staff. And uh, I think Shaq, being a historian of the game, understood Kareem and Magic. LA. Understood all the championships that were in L.A. Understood that they would go to any level to get any free agent to come in and play with him. And then, you know, they surrounded him and Kobe with some great guys. Just watching it from afar and not even knowing if it was true or not, it did seem like there was a little alpha dog stuff with you guys because you were doing so well. Like you were first team All NBA, I think, in '95, and it was kind of like it's your team and his team. Did, was part of it? You think he just wanted his own team? I don't know. Maybe he looked at it that way. I can't really. He never said that to me. Yeah. Because I I knew where my bread was buttered. I knew to get him the ball. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I was gonna get him. I knew I could get my points and make him happy, and I, I felt like that was. That was easy for me to do. So if he felt that way, that was definitely on his own, his own area, not, not anything that I had made him feel any different about. The accolades came from really playing with him. Yeah. You know, it was easier. He was getting double teamed, and it was easier for me to get my game off because it was more one-on-one -on -one, uh, basketball. And, um, you know, my first team all NBAs definitely came from having a guy like Shaq on the team. If you guys don't blow game one, which you never should have blown in the finals. We what win it. What we happens win it. next? You win we that win series? It. We win it. And uh, they gained so much confidence, and we lost confidence. Yeah. They, you could just tell. They were just so hyped. When they, they didn't believe that they could win. We had, I think, a 17-point lead. Coach Hill rested us. He had this system where he would just rest us, yeah. and he'd bring the bench in. And they made a huge run on the bench. Yeah. And when we came back in, it was back and forth from that point forward. That was a stupid season. From the, that was the year the three-point line was too close. That was another thing. It was really easy to come back because you'd make like Man, a 21 Man, they made a footer. lot of threes. Yeah. I just remember Robert Ory, Kenny Smith, Sam Cassell. These guys just seemed like they made Vernon Maxwell through everything. Mario Ellie, everything they shot went in. It just seemed like there was nothing that we could do. You double-team right. Dream, 
they made you pay for it. Right. Play Dream one on one, he scored. It was crazy. They just gained that much confidence because in the regular season, we beat them 20 both games. We had so much confidence. Yeah. It's like when they beat the Spurs, we were excited because we struggled with the Spurs, but we dominated Houston. Yeah. And in the first game, we were up 17 points. We were like, oh, this, we're going to dominate this. And when they won first game, it just knocked all the air out of us. You guys were in some great playoff games that, that for whatever reason, well, they don't show them enough on NBA TV, but just in general, like I was, I was living in Boston, family mm. season ticket holder. It was the last year of the Boston Garden. We won game two. It was yes. the best of five. Yeah. You guys had never really been in a playoff series before as, as a group, and you had these high expectations. Yep. And then we really gave you everything in game three and game four. Those were great games, and everyone just didn't want the garden to go away, and the right. fans were going nuts. So I thought that was always a good test for you. You know, it was crazy because the first game, I think we won like by 40. Yeah. And the second game, they came out and beat us. And we were like, this is not where we're going to end. We're not going to end right here. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Sherman Douglas, Dominique, Rick Fox, and those guys, it was crazy. How you guys had way more talent. We did. They yeah. played well in game two, and then after that, we had to turn it on. Yeah, and then the Bulls series, which I think Jordan got all the tapes destroyed. Those are never <laughs> on, 95. <laughs> I've never seen those games on TV. Never Who on TV. Who has those games? They're, they're, they've just disappeared from yeah. the fabric of society. But, you know, I mean... People just don't, they wipe that off the Jordan resume because he was playing baseball, but you still beat the Bulls. We beat the Bulls. Pippen was on the team. Yeah, I mean, Jordan I look at was it. On the we team. closed down the garden. Congress sold the garden. I don't appreciate that. And we beat Michael. We were the last team to beat him in a playoff series, so we yeah. have some history. You, you took it to him. And they couldn't guard Shaq. No. Shaq had monster games in that series. They couldn't match up with you. And Nick Anderson, for whatever reason, you know, kind of gave it to Jordan a little he bit. Did a dec- he did a yeah, decent job decent. on MJ. You're never going to No, and he him, did but. probably one of the best that I've seen in a playoff series against Michael. Granted, he was just coming back, but Nick took the challenge. Jordan never forgave anybody on that team for that. No. Every time he played you from that point on, no. he, he, and the he next got year, he showed A-plus us. game. Yeah. 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 He got his A-plus game after that. Yeah, he went to bed like at 7 o'clock p.m. before every night before every time he played the Magic, I'm sure. Did you? After did that. he ever even talk to you again? <laughs> no. No, I didn't he talk to Michael eyed, again he for a long time. He, he's so competitive. You knew he was going to come back with a vengeance. What happened? I've, always, well, I've even written about this in my book. You had this famous workout with the Magic mm-hmm. where you were like a top four pick. But everyone thought C-Web was going one. Well, the Magic were going to take mm-hmm. C-Web. It was going to be C-Web and Shaq. You had some workout. And the workout was so great that the Magic came out of the workout and they were like, we're taking Penny Hardaway. We got to figure out some trade. What happened in the workout? Because I just always pictured you like kicking in shots from half court with your feet. Uh, it was an amazing workout. Making shots from the stands. The first workout was um, just strictly just drill work with no one there. So I was in blue chips with Shaq at the time, and he was like, you guys need to bring him down again. Yeah. I promise you, you need to take a better look. Yeah. So when they brought me back down, they had Anthony Bowie, who was their best defender. Yep. They had Nick. They had uh, Dennis Scott. They had pretty much everybody there except for Shaq. And Anthony Bowie guarded me because he was used to guarding all the top stars in the league. He was their defensive guy. And I dominated him the entire day. And they were like, if you could do this to Anthony Bowie, then we know that you're the guy that we needed. So that workout was amazing. I mean, I didn't really miss a shot. All my assists were, I had some unbelievable assists, finding guys uh, um, all throughout the day. Fast break, I pushed the ball every single time. I just had a a vision of what I wanted to really do when I went there and, and it just all I had so much confidence too I didn't feel like anybody could stop me I felt like I was going to go down there and show why I deserved the number one pick but you're this kid from Memphis and people are like Anthony how do you say that and C-Web is this huge famous Fab star five. Fab Five the whole thing and all of a sudden they're like we want this guy instead like what, what were you thinking from a personal standpoint like I was what was going on in my life no, I was loving it because I knew I wanted to have an opportunity to play with a big man. I had yeah. never had an opportunity to play with a, a true big like Shaq. And uh, we were doing, the, another good thing that happened was in the movie Blue Chips, they allowed us just to play pickup ball. It wasn't scripted. So he and I worked really well together, and I made sure of that. Yeah, yeah, And uh, Right. Because I wanted to really play for the Magic, so I had an uh, upper hand on uh, kind of influencing his mind because of the way that we played together. And uh, Coach Pete Newell, rest his, God rest his soul, he was like, Shaq, you need a guard that can really get you to basketball like him. And there well, it was. Well, I wasn't going to talk about Blue Chips, but since you brought it up, and I've seen <laughs> Number it one movie? 75 times, 
I, the Butch McRae, I, I really think, you, you know, I thought you got robbed. That, that's Didn't supporting I? actor. Oscar? Yeah. Supporting actor, on, at least man. the nomination. I thought about that, but I quickly forgot it. <laughs> so, <laughs> that movie, though, like... First of all, I love that they didn't script the basketball scenes. Yeah, and that's the best thing about the movie. And you watch it, and it's a snapshot of all these guys from that era. Like, the other team has Cal Chaney on yes. it, Bobby Hurley, yes. all these dudes on it. And that team was tough. The games are fun. I would almost want to watch all the deleted scenes of the games on YouTube. No, Coach Knight was serious. He was like, I'm not going to... He got mad, right? He almost he got, got thrown out of the because game. Because he was like, at the end... The lob that I threw to Shaq was the only thing that was scripted because we played a real game and they yeah, actually yeah. beat us because they had an all-star team and we had pretty much right. actors. And um, well, you had you Shaq and you he, had Matt Nova, the, right? The first, the first time we threw the lob, he made someone like bump Shaq out and then the, it, they didn't let him do it. And then he looked at the director and like, I just want to let you know I'm not going to let you beat me, you son of a whatever. Right. He just went crazy. <laughs> and then he, uh, he says, now you can do it. Now let him do it. So then the right. second time they let Shaq do it. That's awesome. That's Coach Knight. That was really smart to do that. I, I think that was the only sports movie where they were just like, let's not script this at all. Yeah, I, just, I, I think so, because like if you see everything else, game. it looks scripted. They just let us just play basketball. I had a really tough time in my scene in Chicago. There was a kid. I don't know what was going on this day, but he was, like, defending me really well. I couldn't really get off. And the guys on the, until the guys on the sideline started saying, man, you can't play. You're going to get drafted into the NBA. They started, like, ragging me. Oh, so you got like mad. This was, I got mad, yeah. and then it was, those were the real scenes in the movie. I got mad and started dunking the ball and started really going. I don't know what happened early on, but later on, I just kind of just got mad and took Who over. was the kid? Do you remember? I don't remember. He was in the movie defending me. He was doing a pretty decent job. You know what's funny? Nowadays, nobody would ever let their future NBA lottery pick be in that movie playing in those games. Because there were 100 scouts there, and then people like, ah. I don't know, Penny Hardaway got worked by this extra. <laughs> <laughs> He's out of the top ten. <laughs> yeah. It was a different era. The other thing that was interesting about your era was uh, it was right when players were becoming super-duper empowered. You know, and like C-Web was able to sign this deal where he gets like, I don't know, $80 million, but he's able to get out of it after a year. So all of a sudden he has all this power. Mm -hmm. Shaq has all this power. He can get out. He's going to be a free agent in 96. You have the power because you know you have this deal. You have these out clauses. Kenny I, Garnett. Garnett, but like Kenny Anderson, Derek mm -hmm, Coleman, mm -hmm. Glenn Robinson. I feel like a lot of the guys from that era never reached their potential. It was almost like it was, I call it the too much too soon era. And they've kind of fixed that. And now it's like you got to work for your contract. Right. You got to put in the four years. When you look back, do you wish you had been in the current system or did it not matter to you? It really didn't matter because all those guys that you named were super talented. Yeah. They definitely were worth the money that they got. So compared to the guys. It's not good to get paid $10 million a year when you're 20. But if you can ball, you deserve it. That's how I feel. And yeah. I know what you mean by earning it because I think we did earn it. The, the guys earned it. They went out there and put up numbers on a nightly basis. Right. But, like, Kenny Anderson should have had a better NBA career. That guy was I, like I agree. Crazy he was unbelievable. Talented. The Archbishop, he was... Coleman should have had a better career. DC Robinson was should major. have had a better career. C-Webb had knee injuries, but his career should have been better. You had injuries, too. But yeah. What was your first injury, by the way? It was in 96, 97. Joe Dumars. I'll never forget it. I was going up for a rebound, and he slammed his knee right into the back of my knee. I don't even know if he knew that he hurt me. And uh, from that point on, my knee never felt the same. It just hit me right in the back of the bone, as I extended, he was going for a rebound, and he actually just slammed it right into the back of my knee. And I'll never forget the pain. I finished that series out, and we went to the Eastern Conference Finals. But oh, it was in the playoffs? It never, yes, it never felt the same. So what happened? What was the injury? It, was in a, it ended up being a torn meniscus, but it just, just never felt the same. So torn meniscus, and then that led to something else? Microfracture. Right. I was like one of the first guys to get microfracture. Mm. And the way that it happened was the doctor didn't really explain to me what microfracture was. He went in to repair scope, I mean to repair meniscus again, and said, if I could do a procedure on you that will help prolong your career, I'll do it. He drilled the holes and then told me afterwards I was able to do the procedure. I didn't know what it was, so I was like, if this is going to help my career, I'm, I'm okay. Tried to come back within like a couple, three months. It's like a six-month, almost to a year recovery to me. Yeah. Never, my quad depleted, could never get the strength in my quad, and then I tried to play on that, and that's when my career went down. Right. But you, that was in 2001. That happened after you got the big Phoenix contract, though. Yeah, that was like in 2001. At I got, least you got one giant I contract, got, though. I got hurt by Samarki Walker in the, in the Spurs game. I went in for a layup. 
he hit my upper body and my chest because my, I always use my athleticism, and I was trying to dunk on him, really. And he hit me in the chest, and I fell back, and er, all of my energy and my power went right into my knee. Yeah. And I just felt it, like, buckle, and then it was just – I got 12 quarter zone shots from that playoff series until we finished with the Lakers. So we beat the Spurs in the first round. And then the second round, we played the Lakers when the Lakers came, that big comeback against Portland when yeah. Scottie Pippen and the guys were playing with Portland, Smitty. And um, I had to get 12 quarter zone shots just to play in every game from that point on. And that's when I got the, the microfracture surgery after that Oof. year. So you almost would have been better off just bagging one of those series. Man, Tim Duncan had the same injury, and he didn't play. That was the year he did. He set out the he entire series. Out. He was smart. He's still playing. Yeah, that's true. He's... 45 years old, and still, <laughs> and still good. Still going at it. I thought you were an incredible basketball player. Oh, thank like you. it was, I, I, I feel cheated as an NBA fan just because. I don't know. I don't. I don't even know really who your similar players were. You were kind of, when you when you were, how tall are you? Six eight. Six seven. Yeah. Six seven, just wasn't happening. Now we see it a little bit more. We see yeah. guys with size, but uh, it was just so different at the time. And I do feel like you and Grant Hill. C Web to yeah. a lesser extent, I think C Web lost, you know, a couple years in his prime. But it's just, you know, it's it's just always a bummer to think like, oh man, what if? Yeah, you know? I look at that with you know even D Rose now, Brandon Roy. D Rose is a Brandon Roy is a great one. I so mean, you feel kinship with all those guys? I do because those guys were unbelievable in their rookie years and first yeah. years, second years, and then the injury came and then everything went away. I mean to see Der- Derrick Rose at full speed in college. And then going to the NBA was amazing. I mean, athletic, fast, was to me the best point guard in the league. Yeah. That's why he got the MVP. And then Brandon Roy was on his way to becoming right. that type of player. I meant to ask you about Rose, actually. When, when you watch him and you watch, you think of Rose 2012 versus Rose now, what, and you think of your own situation, like what are the parallels? The, I look at his footwork. Like At first, he would like really dig in and get his speed. Right. Now it's almost like he's jogging on on top of the, of the of the court, meaning like he's not digging in anymore. It's almost like it he's hurts. He's afraid to put all the pressure. Yeah, it's here. not. He used to just go all out, 100 mile an hour, and it's, to me, it's like he plays at 70, 75 now. Like, and then sometimes he'll turn the Jets on. Right. And it's just the pain. Well, I I just remember watching him in person, and then we have to go. But three years ago, you actually like him in Westbrook. Where the two guys were, you actually like fear for their physical safety with the way they play. Yes. Rose will go in the lane, he's, he's planting his leg this way, his body's going this way, and he's just not doing that anymore. No. And I don't, you know, there's this two year lag time, and I'm sure you felt it too, where you knew physically you weren't the same, but everybody's like, yeah, that's Penny Hardaway, he's one of the best players in the league. Yeah. And you know your body's 70% of where it was. Man, and that's, I that's the if hardest. He's at that point. That is the hardest thing when you cannot be as athletic or perform at the level that you really want to. Your mind is telling you, but your body's not allowing you. So do you think he's at that point, or are you just, you don't know? I think he's young enough to recover from it. I think it's going to take a couple years, but right now I think his mind is saying, look, I want to do this, but I have to be careful. I think he's playing more of a careful game while he's healing. How much of that is mental and how much of it is physical? I think it's 50-50. I yeah. think the pain, I felt pain every night. Yeah. And after games, I, it took me a long time to walk to my car after the game, and then driving home, it took me a couple minutes to even just get out of my car and extend my legs and just walk. And I was playing in full games. What are the ads of Blue Chips too? Man, hey, uh, William Friedkin, the director, needs to put that together. I'm ready. Butch, is, Butch <laughs> made 200 million bucks. Now he's a booster. He yeah, and I'm paying the players He can now. do anything for State to win. <laughs> yeah. You weren't at the set when Bob Cousy made all the free throws in a row, right? I wasn't there. I was on, on the property, but I wasn't the in there. that's the sneaky greatest thing about that movie. Yes. One take. Yes. He just he's doing lines, it. and he made like 20 straight free yes. throws with Nolte, and Nolte ad lib like, don't you ever miss? <laughs> he's yeah. like, no, just made three more. Penny Hardaway. Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. I'll see you in thank Memphis. You. All right. Because I, th- I think your team's going to be there. I All right, so will you too. set up Gus's for us? Yes, I will. All right. I'll make that happen. More with All-Star Weekend coming up. The BS Report live from New York City, All-Star Weekend. What a pleasure. The Chief, Robert Parrish. Um, you guys were the original big three. Does it bother you when these other three-man star units in the NBA take the big three? I feel like you guys created the big three, right? I think it's flattering myself. Oh, flattering. And, okay. and a compliment. Yeah? Yeah, they didn't want to mimic what we did. Do you feel like, has there been a big three 
out there that you feel like was as good as your big three? Or is it everybody just following? Well, the big three when we was playing, Kareem, Magic, and Worthy, I thought we was all on the same playing field. Yeah, but um, I'm biased. I thought you guys were better. Well, one, e, one and one E. Is <laughs> that close, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I always feel like uh, they had the edge because of Kareem. Yeah. You know, that, that guy hook, man, was woof. Yeah, he's kind of Ooh. the... <laughs> Something else. He doesn't get mentioned enough when people talk about the greatest players of all time. I thought it, I had him ranked in the top three just because to play 20 years in your era is, like, impossible. I know I'm, I'm biased. My big three, my best all-time big three are all big men. Yep. Chamberlain, Russell, and Kareem. And put them in any order you want to put them in. Right. I, you miss Chamberlain and Russell, though. I watched them. I didn't play against yeah, them, yeah. but I, I watched them play, yes. Mm -hmm. But Kareem, you were there basically from the late 70s he, all the way through. He broke my heart a lot of times with that sky hook. <laughs> yes. what, what was like your strategy for that? Because it was, it was the only unstoppable shot in the history of the NBA. My strategy against playing against Kareem was to make him work for everything he got, not to give him nothing easy, yeah. run him in the transition game, because you, you're not going to stop him. So my philosophy was try not to keep him over 30, 30 or less. I did a great job. If he get 30 or more, he's dominating the game. And so we don't have a chance of winning. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you feel, could you see it with him, some games where you're just like, uh-oh, he's, he's, he's locked in today. I'm in trouble. Oh, without a doubt. You, 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 can, you can just, uh, the way he's playing and that, like you said, that look that he gets. Yeah. You know, it's going to be one of those nights. And like I said, what you pray for, try to keep him 30 or less. Because right. he gets over 30, that means he's dominating the, the game completely. Did you feel like the refs would let you get away with a little bit more when you were defending him, maybe than a typical center? Could you shove him a little bit more or do other things? No, uh, I have to say that uh, he had the respect of the officials, yeah. so you couldn't get away with a lot of that. And not to mention they were trying to clean up the game some too, so they were starting to cut down on the hand checking and the elbows and the, the lower back. Right. Um, do you hold it against the Lakers that they never showed up for the 86 finals? Not at all. that was your best team. Not at all. It was about time. Because Magic always brags, like, we beat them two finals they to one. Did. It's like, they you didn't did. show up in 86. <laughs> and we that counts for the Celtics. We appreciate that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was your best team, though. Oh, you were beating anyone that year. Oh, without a doubt. I, I feel like, hands down, we were the best team in the league, period. What, how did the Bill Walton thing work with you? Because, you know, you're the starting center. He's the 77 finals MVP. He comes in. He's coming off the bench. Mm -hmm. Were you threatened at all, or were you like, this is great? This guy's going to make my life easier. One of the reasons uh, that I had uh, Bill Walton inducted into the Hall of Fame was for this one reason. When he first came to the Boston Celtics, the first place he stopped after he met with Red Arback, he came to my house. Really? To see was I comfortable with him being on the team. And I tried to tell him that I, I had no leverage in who was, who was on the team or wasn't on the team, but I appreciate his consideration. Yeah. Yeah, so that with me, that resonated with me because he didn't have to come and, it, and ask me was I comfortable with him being on the team. And I always respected him for that. And you guys, I mean, not only was, I think that was the best team ever, but you guys had great chemistry in that team and he became kind of, kind of the lightning rod for all the jokes and yeah. that was kind of the hidden thing with him, right? Everybody, everybody was making fun of him and, and teasing him and he just loved it. Like he was so happy. He hadn't really played in eight years. I, I think that was one of his healthiest years, that 86, uh, 87 season, yeah. uh, from a health standpoint, because as you know, he suffered through so many oh, injuries. Yeah. And I tell you, there were days when he was feeling good, yeah. he disrupted practice. No layups. None. Really? None whatsoever. That's how good Bill was. And, and, and Kevin Larry and myself, we always pride our on ourselves to be able to get whatever shot that we wanted. Yeah. When Bill was right, anything five feet in, he either blocked it or he altered it. Right. And you could see the the passing with him and Bird once they started to kind of figure out each other. Oh, and the trash talking between Larry and Bill. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Somebody should be recording, it, even though you couldn't couldn't play it on uh, on a family station. But, ooh, <laughs> on Showtime or Cinemax, something like that, it would have been great uh, <laughs> to, to listen to that and, and see the activities going on during the scrimmages. You played with Larry, basically. You missed his rookie year, mm -hmm. but then you, the rest of the time, you guys were on the same team. And the, the trash talking for him was like the underrated thing. Like he, 
that that was what got him going, and he would just lay into people. Did you ever feel, was there ever a night where you felt like he was going too far? You were like, uh-oh. Well, Larry made a personal period. Every night he went too far. He and Kevin and, and uh, Michael Jordan yeah. were the all-time great at trash talking, in my opinion. What was the best Larry Bird trash talking game that you remember? Or did they all blend together at this point? Uh, I can't say it on. <laughs> you totally can. Oh, oh, the family. This isn't on TV. No, we're not a family. You can say it. We'll bleep it. You're going to have to. <laughs> Let's hear it. We're ready. Uh, I don't know. I can't think of the, the coach name for the Phoenix Suns. Uh, John McLeod? His assistant. Yeah. I can't think of his name, but he was a trash talker, you know, and he used a few questionable, I should say colorful language. Right. And so he was talking all this trash to Larry that he was overrated, and you know, and he was one of the uh, called him a sorry M, uh, MF white player. Uh uh-uh. And Larry told him that he was a he was the baddest MF white player that ever came through the league. <laughs> and we were down by six points at the time, and Larry and, and Larry told him just for talking <laughs> to me, I'm going to hit two threes right here in front of your face, and I'm going to tell you, you to kiss my white ass. <laughs> and he did it, too, <laughs> to win the game. <laughs> That's hilarious. The, uh, uh, <laughs> the 60-point game was another one with uh, the, just for whatever reason he got going. And I think that was nine days after Mikhail at 56. Mm-hmm. I think maybe that was part of it, too. Those guys, there was a little bit of competitiveness with them, right? A little bit. Yeah, really? Kalen Bird. Maybe <laughs> really? a lot. <laughs> oh, they, oh, nice. they were very competitive, which which I thought was great because they pushed each other yeah. and, and inspired one another. And one thing I always respected about Larry and Kevin, during their premium years, they got better every year. Right. They came back a better player every year, and yeah. I always respected that about them. My favorite Celtic team was the 87 team. Even, which didn't win the title, but you guys were just so banged up that year. Yeah, no, Everybody was hurt. Up, right. Exactly. You had, you had, what do you have, ankles? Ankle. Sprain, a couple sprained ankles. Sprained ankles, both ankles. Kale the sprain, broken foot. foot. Larry the back. DJ had sprained ankle. ankle. Exactly. Bird had the back. Ainge sprained his ankle. Just, Walton was out basically the whole time. Just to get back yeah, to, yeah. to the final, I thought it was an accomplishment considering our, our health issues. And the, and the crowd helped. I'm going to take some credit too because I went to oh, some of those the games. The fans in Boston the fans were, were, were the best. So, Definitely. I got to ask you about the Pistons series. Mm-hmm. So, Lambeer, do you still hate Lambeer? You must still hate him, right? I never have hated Lambeer. You never hated never him? Never hated him. Did you hate him when you played? No, I just didn't like him. <laughs> okay. That's all. I never hated him. You know, I respected him, but I, I didn't like it. Because you were this you were this serene guy. We called you the chief. Mm-hmm. Lambeer was the one guy that just... He got under your skin. It, it was just the same old thing. You know, he's stepping on my, on my, on my foot. So I, Intentionally? I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't jump. You right. know, we, we both looking up for a rebound. And he's and stepping on your foot. stepping on my foot. Oh, he grabbing a handful of my shorts. Uh, or when, when I'm, I'm holding him off, posting up, he would stick his arm under my arm, pull my arm down like I'm pinning his arm. Right. You know, little stuff and then like he'd yeah, then he'd flop. Out. Exactly, you know. He give um, you a little couple elbows, right, in the it, kidneys? Be, before we got into our little altercation, you know, he had elbowed me in, in the throat. Yep. And I told him to keep watch his elbows. Yeah. We all throw elbows. But but you try not to try not to hurt anyone. So he told me to go F off. Yeah. So that did it. Well, and then the game before, he he cheap shot at Bird. Whole yeah. big fight. I'm, gets kicked out. Mm-hmm. They come into that game, game five, Eastern Finals, and the crowd wants him wants his blood, basically. Oh no, no. He the type of player that you, you dread playing against. Yeah. But you want him on your team. Right. Because he does all the dirty stuff. Right. Yes. Definitely. You got Rick Roby was a little bit like that. I mean, he wasn't as dirty as Lambert, but he was definitely like bouncing oh, oh, yeah. off he, people. Oh, very, very this. physical ball player. Definitely. So, game five, you end up just decking Lambert. Mm-hmm. And I always feel like I, I've written this. I feel like the crowd kind of telepathically willed you to do that. <laughs> we wanted somebody to punch him. Uh, you know I don't what? think you've been I'm, in a I'm, fight. Have you been in another fight in the you know, 80s? I was your only one. I've laughed because I heard a number of people told me that. Oh, you said pe- so, the fans. So many people wanted somebody to deck him. That I guess what you call it, telepathy. Because yeah, everybody, everybody kind of wheeled me to do that. I, I've heard that many times before. Yeah. Because <laughs> so he he kind of elbowed you like a couple plays before. Mm-hmm. It goes down. It comes back. 
And if you watch the tape, like he barely touches you, and you were just so ready for anything. Well, and, well, and then it, all of a sudden, it, that was it, it, you're decking him. It wasn't that one play. It was, it was accumulation play. of right. players, oh, oh, plays over the years. You know, I, I just had enough. And that's the only, only player that ever rattled me. I always pride myself on staying calm and in control. You know, a player that made me lose it, ever. In my, yeah, because I was going to say, do you ever been in another fight in the 80s? Only fight I ever had, period. Well, <laughs> you won. Well, I only had he one. Never, he never got the punch. For whatever reasons, I've I never been in an altercation before. After you did it, were you like, oh, my God, I'm going to get kicked out? I said, oh, my God, because I knew I had just hurt the team. I knew our chance of winning was pretty much done after that. And, well, and that's why I feel bad about it, because it, it was a loss for the for our team. Well, fortunately for you, the refs were in Boston. The crowd was crazy, and there was no way they were kicking you out of that game. So you stayed in. Yeah. The ref was right there watching it, and he's like, ah, foul on Parrish. I couldn't believe it. Both refs said they didn't see it. I, can't, I couldn't believe they didn't see it. The guy was right under the basket. He said you didn't see what happened. Yeah. The... Uh, and then you got you got suspended for game six. Right. Nowadays, in the internet era, you probably get suspended for like five games. For life. <laughs> <laughs> be a life a, a, a year ban is not a life ban if I did that today. And that was also the same game when Bird stole the ball. I'm going to say that was the best basketball game I've, I've, I've probably, non-game seven, I think I've ever been to. Just from a crowd up and down I've had, I've had to say that one for me and also the, the duel between Dominic and Larry. Unbelievable. When Larry coming back that off, off, the, off that back injury, and that was an unbelievable game by both sides, I thought. Plus, he did the thing. They, they could have beaten you in game six, and they didn't, and they missed the play at the buzzer, and Bird, and Bird said something to the reporters like, oh, they missed their chance. It's over an hour or oh, something. Oh, without a doubt. He used oh, to yeah. love doing that. You only get so many chances with right. us. And that's one thing I always liked about us, you know, whether you were a contender or a pretender. We came to play every night. And I always admired and respected about the teams I played on in Boston. So what was the most, out of the three title teams, what was your, do you have a favorite or are they all, they're they all did, your favorites? They're all my favorite. They all resonate with me. But I have to say, uh, from a pure tan- talent standpoint and camaraderie, the 8 of 16. With, with, with Bill Walter. Oh, the, like I said, the trash talking on the planes and in <laughs> practices and just hanging out between he, Larry, and Kevin who was the best white player? Oh, you had to be there. <laughs> who got uh, who? Who did everybody tease more, Michaela? Or, I mean, uh, Walton or Danny Ainge? Because it seemed like Danny Ainge was like a little well, that, bit that, of a... Danny Ainge. He was the whooping ball on the team. Everybody. He's like the little brother. Everybody lit into him. <laughs> Plus, he was cheap as the day is long, too. Really? Like we like all of you on the team, and we all go out to eat. Yeah. Everybody just say. One one bill and y'all pitch in twenty twenty five dollars or whatever. Yeah. Danny was the only one when they want a separate check. Every time we went out to eat, seriously, he wanted a separate check. Cheap. Oh my word, was he cheap? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the eighty one team. So we traded for you. Mm-hmm. It was a pretty good trade. We traded the first pick in the draft for you and McHale. Right. I'm going to say that was a good trade. I think that worked out for us. It but turned when, out to how be. How were you available? Yeah. I mean, uh, you're, you were, the, I would say, one of the top eight centers of all time, and you were in the beginning. You it, hadn't even hit your prime yet. Why, did, it, why were it, you even there? At the time, I wasn't uh, a type top eight center. You were at like, the a, time. like an 18 and 10, though. And yeah, you were, what, I was. 23, 24? But it, in terms of maximizing my talents, yeah. I hadn't done that yet. So there's still a lot of questions. Yeah. About my ability and, and what I was capable of. So I feel like Red took a chance because I was a relatively unknown. Yeah. In my opinion, anyway. I was a relatively unknown player at the time. You came from Golden State, which was a pretty strange team that had a lot of weird. Yeah. Weird, different. A lot of talent, <laughs> I would like to say different. Some guys with personal problems. Yeah, it was a weird it. era for the league. Yeah, it was. It was a different team. A lot of Definitely. stuff going on. Mm-hmm. If you wrote a book, how many chapters would be about that team? Oh, the first five or six. So first of all, that's where my career started at. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I, I definitely have uh, a lot of respect for that organization because uh, they gave me my first shot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, I never asked about the 81 Sixers. That was the biggest war, right, out of all the series? I always feel like uh, when Moses came, that's when the, 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 the uh, robbery went to another level, I thought. It was, it was always There's a fight every year at that point. Oh, yeah, Moses... Uh, Gave them that shot in arm that they needed in, in terms of being, and I, in my opinion, being our equal once they got Moses. 
Is it true he would just, like, during games, you just hear him just grunting, going for rebounds? Like, uh, uh. Yeah, very intense. And, and, and uh, he had a high motor. Yeah. Very, very competitive. I always respected Mosey because he just kept going and going and going, relentless. Yeah, see, he would have been my least favorite player to play against if I were you. Because it just seemed like he never quit. He was just yeah. rebound for, for, after rebound. For me, it was Kareem because it was just frustrating. Yeah. Because he's the only player I played against. I could never alter his shot ever. The only player I played against. Yeah. Never could just change no his shot. And, and you knew exactly what he was going to do, too, every time. Mm. And because of his length and his athletic ability, and I, I have st- said this many times, Kareem left leg should be in the Hall of Fame. And I mean that. That left, because the, uh, have you ever paid attention to when he, in his prime, yeah. the elevation on his hook shot was like someone shooting a jump shot. The right. lift that he got to shoot that shadow over uh, his opponents was well, you had unbelievable. That, you had the drop step on the baseline that nobody figured out for 15 years. Took him a while. Took him a while. I like that. Figured out and for the time caught up with me. I got, we got to get the chief for like an hour. At some point, whenever you're in L.A., you got to tell us. I was very I got, kind I got of Many you. more questions. Well, I have to say all of you make it so easy and yeah. comfortable for me. I appreciate right, that. Good. Thank you. Thank you for everything. I appreciate that. Robert Parrish. All of you. We're back on All-Star Weekend with more stuff after this. All-Star Weekend, New York City. Uh, a New York City basketball icon. I think there's, there's probably a handful that are on a list by themselves. This is one of them, Bernard King. One of my favorite players. One of the only non-Celtics I ever actually liked. <laughs> <laughs> so you were a true blue Celtic I loved fan. your game. Nobody's well, had your you. game since. Well, thank you. You know, I, I think my game was unique. Uh, Definitely was, unique. It, 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 was, it was different. It was well thought out. Yeah. And, you know, Ice and I were talking basketball downstairs. I just had breakfast with him. Ice. Finger roll, girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we're talking basketball. One of the things I pointed out to him, uh, I thought the game out because I didn't think I was a very creative player, though. Yeah. And so on the wing position, at the small forward position, uh, there's only five ways you can be defended by a single defender. Only five. Okay. Force your right because they think you have a weak right hand. Force your left because they think your left hand is weak. Give you the jump shot because you're a poor jump shooter. Play you tight because you don't have the ability to break down defense or deny you. Those are only five ways you can ever be defended by a single defender at the wing position. So to be an effective scorer, all you have to do is to come up with five moves to counter the five defensive ways you will defend me. So and you, you have to give me one. So you can go left, you go right. Go left, jump shot. go right, jump shot, and I can break down the defense and I can break down the denial. And so if I have five moves to counter your yeah. five ways you're going to defend me, then it all it comes down to is this. On the left-hand side of the floor, I had nine spots I would shoot from. Baseline, between the foul line and the baseline is the midpoint area. Yeah. That's the third area right there. And then horizontal to that, you step off of the lane. And between the three-point line and in the lane, one, baseline, one, two, three, up to the foul line. That's six. Then step out off of that. Right. One, two, three. None. So you just practice those nine spots? That's it. Interesting. And the same thing on the right-hand side of the floor. Yeah. And then in the center of the lane, in the lane. So you got 18. Yeah. 19. 20 in the middle. Foul line is 20. Uh, between the top of the key and the foul line, 21, then 22 at the top of the key. Right. So I got 22 spots that I'm going to operate from you. You'll never see me shoot anywhere else. Then obviously transition. But... Five ways to be defended. I got five counters to how you're going to defend me, and I'm going to get to one of those spots. And then it comes down to how well am I shooting the ball that night. And that's yeah. where I practice from every day, Bill. So that's why I shot over 52% for my career. Yeah, your stats, you missed your, you missed your uh, era with advanced metrics. The advanced metrics were kind for you. High, free throw, high field goal percentage. Good shot selection. You didn't take a lot of threes to like. No, I didn't take any down. threes. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> didn't, didn't, take you didn't any... mess with the three-point line. No, I, I didn't because uh, we didn't have an offense. At least when I played in New York or uh, yeah. Golden State and, and with the Nets, you know, we didn't have a three-point oriented offense, and the league wasn't really geared toward that. Yeah, uh, you utilized that when the game was on the line. You right. know, if you're you're trailing by three, you need a three-point shot. Miracle shot. Yeah, you, you didn't you didn't really integrate that into your nightly scheme that you were going to play that night. So I had a Nerf hoop in the 80s. And like every <laughs> other kid in the 80s would imitate the two-hand 
Yeah. Wait, when did the two-hand dunk... I, I feel like you had the best two-hand dunk of all the two-hand dunkers. I, Most I people do this, that. but you were always... Yeah, well, when always did that start? With, what age? I, I, would, I would have to say that that started in, in high school. Yeah. You know, I had pretty good hops in high school. And that's, you know, also, in, you know, in college and... Dude over I your was brother first? You I was 6'5". Tested over your brother you, first? Do you have a younger times? brother? Bill? I do not. I'm only. You're an only? Yeah. Okay, like my wife. Yeah. Well... I tell you what, when you're when you're in the twelfth grade, you don't hang out with your brother that's in the ninth grade. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> you, you, you know, you don't play basketball against a ninth grader. So he, ne you never let him tag along, and no, he was off playing with with guys his you age. Should say for the audience, Albert King, who also Albert played King, in the NBA. my, my yeah. brother who played in the NBA for many 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 years. Yep. And it was always tough on my parents uh, because I played for the Knicks and he played for the Nets at the same time. Right. And we both played the same position. Yeah. Now, as a parent, you have to sit there and watch your sons compete against each other. And, you know, I remember one game, Bill, at Madison Square Garden where he inadvertently poked me in my eye. And Are I you went, sure it was inadvertent? <laughs> I, would, I would hope so. <laughs> but I went to the floor clutching the ball. Yeah. And, and, and he stood over me. I saw it on the film later. Uh, you know, doing a little dance, like, oh my goodness, what did I do? And and Buck was trying to, Buck Williams of the Nets, was trying to tell him to grab the ball, grab the ball. Right, right, right. So I felt, uh, that was always tough for my parents. And then we played against each other in the playoffs, where everything's on the line. Um, that first series, first round, and they had a better record than us. Uh, I, I was fortunate to help the team and scored 40 points the first game, and we won. And so now that gave us a uh, home court advantage, and we went on to, uh, to win that series. How did you end up at University of Tennessee? Well, you know what they did, Bill, at Tennessee? They what they did? They promised me I would start. Wow, that was <laughs> I it. I didn't believe them. Yeah. I, didn't, I visited Arizona State. I visited some other schools. But Ernie Grunfeld was there. Yep. And Ernie was a New Yorker. And so we, we hit it off from day one. He was a great player. We did a little documentary about you two at, yeah, that's at right. one point. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The Ernie and Bernie. Yeah. A lot of people like to change it around and call it the Bernie and Ernie show. And as I told Ernie, it's the Ernie and Bernie right, show. Right, right. And it always will be because yeah, that, yeah. that's what it was. Uh, but he was a great player. You know, a lot of people don't re remember Ernie. But Ernie scored 25 points a game. Yep. In, 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 that was you know, like in a college. top 12 pick. Yeah, right? but, you yeah. know. Combined, we, we combined for 50 points a night. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at that time, you, you know, you take a, a Jewish guy and a black guy in the South at that time, that era, yeah. given the, the environment we were all living in at the time, uh, it was pretty interesting, <laughs> to say the least. If you had to do it over again, where would you go to college? Same Ten thing? Tennessee. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, formed great relationships uh, there. Um, the coaches were, were, were excellent. And... They really cared about the players. They cared about you as people. Yeah. Um, I suffered a compound, compound thumb fracture uh, just before our tournament when it was scheduled to start the NCAA. Yeah. And um, I couldn't play. But at halftime, the coach told me to go suit up. I learned later he was never going to play me. He was just hoping that it would inspire my, my teammates yeah, to yeah. go and win the game. But there are some coaches that would have played me with a compound fracture, and he, he would not. And he didn't want to had, jeopardize my career. You've had some, you had a lot of different hand issues. How many, <laughs> how many broken fingers and thumbs did you have? Well, I, uh, when I was with the Knicks, I dislocated my middle finger uh, playing against Boston and Cedric Maxwell. Wow. Yeah. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Cedric is, you know, he was a tremendous player. Great yeah, guy. but he made the mistake of saying that you couldn't get forty against him. Well, I didn't. As a Celtic fan, I didn't like when he said that because I knew I knew you could probably get forty against him. You know, I, I never went out and thought, okay, I'm gonna score forty tonight. All yes, you I did. That, Don't say that. No, you totally I, I did. did. I, I really did, Bill. I really did. I had the capabilities of doing that. And when I decided to score a lot of points, is because we needed. Yeah, that's that's the reason for that. Also, because you you were in the zone for like. 18 months there. Well, it, it, you were the easiest bet to score 40 <laughs> points. Other than, I, I mean, seriously, like, I, I would say out of all the guys I watched, Jordan, mm -hmm. Durant, Kobe, 
And I, I, for that 18 months before you hurt your knee that first time, I, I, th- I think you were on there. I think you could have dropped 40 against anybody. Yeah, I, I think you're probably you just, right. You must have known at, in those games, really, like, oh, it's, it's a mistake if I don't score 40 points tonight. Well, it was one of those periods of my career when I stepped on the floor. Um, my, my attitude and my thought was that I'm the best player in the world. Yeah. That's the level that I reached, and, and that's the mindset I, I took out onto the floor every game. And you talk about that series against Boston. Incredible series. First 84. Game, yeah, 84. First game, no bill. Uh, at Madison Square Garden. Maxwell walks up to me at, right there at the center jump circle. And he says, he stands in front of my face and said, why do you look like that? Because I had my game face on. And yeah. that's how I played every night. Right. And I didn't say a word to him. Because I knew all he was trying to do was throw me off my game. Right. So I, I didn't even respond. And, um, you know, you talk about him saying, um, I won't even use the word he associated with that comment. <laughs> you right. know, that B won't get 40 on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we joke about it to this day. Those are great YouTube clips because those games are on YouTube. They, yeah. the, the MSG games are just wars. They were, I mean, that Celtics team was, was. Oh, that was a great team. Ludicrously talented. You Four guys did Hall not have as much talent. Four Hall right. of Famers on, on, on that team. And, and a couple great guys to throw at you. They had Ma- Maxwell and Mikhail. And Mikhail would do the, get those long arms. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me tell you something. That I guess they learned that from Detroit. <laughs> yeah. In terms of those guys on the Celtics. One guy would hit you, Bill. Yep. And then a second guy would hit you. Oh, the second after, hit. After the foul was called, a right. second guy would hit you. That's now, a free hit, though. That's exactly right. <laughs> and so that's, that's what they did against me in that series. Yeah. But, yeah, I had to, to control my, my, my emotions and just play basketball. But if we had one more guy, yeah. one the Knicks, if we had one more guy <laughs> in that series against the Celtics, uh, we would have beat them. And I tell you what sticks in my craw. Are you going to talk about the officiating in Game 7? No. Because Hubie, stay, if, if you bring that up to Hubie, it's like <laughs> a 20-minute rant. Oh, really? Yeah, he th- he doesn't think it was officiated fairly. Well. Game seven. I, I don't know about the officiating. Okay, so what sticks but, in your craw? Bird outplayed me. In game seven. Bird yeah. was great in that game. He outplayed me. And and in a big game, I'm supposed to never be outplayed. Right. But he outplayed me that game. I That's do, what I remember. I do think, yeah, he had like a 39, 10, and 12, something yeah. like that. Crowd yeah. was into had a, it. Had a, he had a great game. But I, I do think those teams, for whatever reason, the matchup was close enough that if Game 7 had been in New York. Oh, we would have won that game. Right. But that's why you play the 82 games. That's, that's exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Exactly right. Yeah. You and Bird, though, I mean, obviously, I, you know how I feel about Bird. Oh, but out of all the small forwards, you were the one that, because he kind of owned everybody from that era. Like, it would be like, oh, great, Kelly Chapuka. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, you I, like I, some of those I guys, too. I thing with Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> Kiki Vandeway, oh, Mark Aguirre. No, I didn't do that with Kiki. Maybe Bird did, and I couldn't do that with Mark either, but. Really? You, you could do that? What are you talking about? You could do that with everybody. Well, when, when it I It wasn't had like it. a very, like the Rodman era had not arrived yet. Yeah, uh, the Rodman Pippen, just these scary big six foot seven, six foot eight guys with long arms. Yeah, but when you're going against great scorers and Kiki and, and Mark, were so they're wearing you out in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, you you have to play both ends of the floor right. uh, uh, that night, and so they were they were a challenge. You know, interestingly enough, uh, I became a free agent, Bill, uh, with the Knicks. I remember. Right, and I had to come back from my knee injury, and my my representative was Bob Wolf. And he also Bird's represented, yeah. you know, Bird as well. And so he set up a uh, meeting with, with the Celtics. What? Yeah, no one, really, no one knew about this. It never came out at the time. And so I, I fly so to... this is 87? That's 87. Okay. You got it. And so I fly to Boston uh, to meet with the Celtics. And I, sitting in the room is, is Red Arback, Alan Cohn, and Casey Jones. <laughs> right. Now, Red is the first one to speak. Never forget it. Great, great man. He said, um, Bernard, why do you want to play for the Celtics? You know we have a pretty good small forward here. <laughs> <laughs> Loading the bird, obviously. And uh, I said, I, I, I want to win a championship. So you were thinking like the Bill Walton kind of six man coming off the bench, huge impact. No. But you were thinking you were going to start. I believe I start wherever I go. But they, you they have Mikhail and Bird. But you have to 
Well, that doesn't mean you're not going to compete. Right. I'm, a, I'm a competitor. Okay, so you're taking you respect Kale's job. everyone, right? But you respect no one when you step on the floor. I like that. Well, you respect would... everyone, but you respect no one when I'm you step on the floor. I'm pretty sure you were to help that team. I I, I believe we had I no could. bench and, and and whether I came off the bench or not, it didn't matter. But I'm but you have to compete for the job mm. as you as if you want to start because then you're going to play at your level that you're normally consistent with. And that's why they're sitting with you talking table to begin with. And so if I came off the bench, great. I'm coming off the bench and chance to win the championship. Yeah. So uh, it, it didn't work out. First game that year, uh, I now signed with Washington, right? I know where you're going with this story because I watched that game. Tell me. Bird hits the three. No. Oh, that was the name? Oh, good the, the beginning of the game, you know, we all walk up the center court, obviously. Yeah. And Bird walks by me. You know what he says to me? You cost me a championship. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what he said to me. Because he and I, we never talked on the floor. And that's what he said to me. So, you know, his thought, I guess, was if I had joined a team, he would have won another championship. I would have won mine. Well, that, that's what I'm thinking right now. I can't concentrate on the interview anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you you would have helped us. But my heart's in New York. And had I teamed with Patrick, that would have been beautiful. When I came back from my injury, Patrick Young obviously is the man, he, you know, right. on the on the team, and I would have meshed my skills with Patrick because it would have been his team. The problem, though, is the reason they got Patrick was because you got hurt. Yeah, I'm laying in the hospital. Yeah. When when we drafted him, 41 metal staples running down my knee, and everyone said my career was over. Uh, the doctors told me my career was over. You went into basically hiding. You were you were working out, rehabbing. Nobody knew where you were, what you were doing. It was a big mystery. What's the greatest challenge you ever had in life? Not, nothing like that. Well, if you have a, a, a challenge where everyone says it can't be done, yep. and they tell you your career is over, do you want people telling you when you see them every day, oh, I'm sorry, you had a great career. You know, it's unfortunate that, that you got hurt and you can't play anymore. Yeah. If someone tells you you're beautiful every single day, you're going to start to believe you're beautiful. If someone tells you you're, you're nothing and you're a piece of dirt every single day, eventually that's going to seep in and that's what you're going to think of yourself. So you wanted to keep everyone away from you? Push everyone away and only center in on what I'm thinking and feeling. Yeah. And I believe that it could be done. So what was your injury? I tore my anterior cruciate ligament at a time when nobody right. Came so back now, from now you'd be back in ligaments. Yeah, you'd be nine months later. You'd be scrimmaging. The advance of medical science, and we didn't have that. And I tore my anterior, I broke a bone, and uh, tore a cartilage. I mean, when you got hurt, you were I think thirty three a game. Yeah, I was the leading that was your, your in career. The NBA. The preceding for year, a career year. The, the players uh, voted me to the most valuable player in the league in the preceding year. So I'm at the top of my game. Yeah. yeah I'm 28 years old, and, I'm, and that's when I went down. Um, we have to talk about, I have to go backwards. We got to talk about Fast Break. Ha! <laughs> fast Break. You remember that? That's do amazing. I remember Fast Break? Yeah. Jacoby, remember do I remember Fast Break? Fast break? I'm obsessed with Fast Break. <laughs> we have our Grantland <laughs> studio, and we have the original Fast Break poster. Get out of here. And every time they try to refresh it and move the posters around, and he's like, can we move the Fast... What happens? It's an ugly poster and it needs to move. <laughs> no, it's not an ugly poster. It it's Gabe Kaplan with the ball, uh, spinning the ball. Yeah. All right, so first of all, one of the great basketball movies of all time. Second of all, uh, a great movie of that era, the late 70s. You played Hustler. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Gabe Kaplan goes, he gets this job in uh, some small Division One school in Vegas. Uh-huh. Goes and, and he's got to put a team together. So he grabs all these character basketball players. You were Hustler. For some reason, you didn't have a Division One scholarship, even though you were amazing in the movie. Yeah. Unclear. I, I, unclear know, I, was, why. I, was, I, was, I was a pool player. Yeah, that, that's was, why I was a Hustler. That's yeah, how I made my you money. You gave up basketball <laughs> to play pool for some yeah, reason. Yeah, exactly right. And, and he, he came to me and he said, I would like you to play for me at, at, at a school, Cadwallader University. Right. And he said, you know, I know you know everyone, so I want you to help me recruit other players here from, from New York, from the playgrounds, to play on the team. So, so you go and find D.C. Dacey, DC who's Dacey, in hiding. Right. You find Swish, who was really a woman. That's right. And you find Michael Warren's character, Preacher. Preacher, exactly. Who 
I think was hiding from it, some mafia yeah, boss yeah, so he, who's going to kill know, him. Well, he got someone pregnant, daughter's pregnant. Yeah, that's right. so yeah, he so was, he's got to leave. He, he's in hiding. He's got to get out of town. I wouldn't say this was a politically correct movie. <laughs> no, it wasn't. You're but driving cross country. You end up, there's pot in the car. Yeah, you we, see we, cops. We, we, everybody's going to eat the get, pot. Uh, we get stopped. And, you know, uh, D.C. Dacey, he, he was selling pot. So he's got, <laughs> Gabe Kaplan says, you know, the coach, you know, anyone has anything in this car? He said, yeah. He said, what do you got? I got a pound. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, for us as actors, it was wheat. And so yeah. now we're going to stuff this wheat in our mouth, supposedly pot, and because the sirens are behind us. Supposedly pot. Well, it wasn't pot. It was <laughs> what wheat. What was it? Wheat. Oh, it was wheat. Yeah, it was wheat. So we're stuffing fake wheat. Pot. Interesting. Yeah, fake pot. Okay. Uh, stuffing wheat. I wouldn't have eaten that. But uh, you we're never know. It's we, the 70s. We, stuffing <laughs> wheat in our mouth. And then the police car passes by. Yeah. And we all have this look of amazement, like, oh, why did we eat this? <laughs> and so that was that was the end of that. So you that go was there, a fun you, movie. You got to find it. I more auditioned players. for it. I you auditioned for it. Yeah. Who'd you beat out? Uh, my, my representative called me up and said, uh, there's a movie being done, and they specifically asked that you come in and audition. I said, hey, why not? You know, I go in and, I, you know, being naive, Bill, I thought I was going to be the only one there. Yeah. I was not the only one there. There was like 20 other people. Yeah. And they're having auditions on both coasts. And so I go in, I, I do the reading, and they said, we'd like you to come back tomorrow. And they gave me a script. So I went home and I rehearsed all night. And never forget it, driving through the Lincoln Tunnel from uh, New Jersey to, to Manhattan for the second part of that audition, yeah. I yelled to myself, you're going to get this. You're going to get this. And I wound up getting the part. Hustler. Yeah. We had a great time. I got to say, you were a pretty good actor in that movie. Well, I mean, I've only watched it like 120 times, but <laughs> see, you're pretty no, it was good fun. though. Well, thanks. Great basketball scenes. It had just come out of my rookie you year. You had the spin move. You had you a know? couple two hand dunks. Big yeah. game in front of the crowd at the end. Yeah, you know, I spent uh, spent two months in Los Angeles, out in Hollywood. Yeah, you know, can you imagine? You're 20 years old, uh, seventh leading scorer in the league. Yeah, and now you're in Hollywood shooting a movie. Hey, come on, what else can you want? Do you remember where you stayed? Stayed in in in. They put me up in Beverly Hills, gave me this apartment there. And, uh, so you're in L.A. In the for heart. the summer in the late 70s. Yeah. Hanging out with Gabe Kaplan. Um, Gabe Kaplan, who kind of had a decent game. Yeah, he did. You guys play in the first scene. You're playing pickup, and he's, I don't know. He yeah, had he, had a, a, nice he had a real good game. He was, yeah. a, he was a, actually able to play. Yeah. You know, but he was the biggest television star in the world at that time. because of Walk, Because of Welcome Back Home. Yeah. And he, he took me to the Playboy Mansion right. <laughs> at 20 years old. And I said, wow, this is fun. <laughs> we, we, we truly had a good time. But we had such camaraderie together. We, we all dined together. And when we weren't shooting, we played pickup basketball. Right. We actually played games, which uh, because Mike Warren was point guard at UCLA, Harold Sylvester played at uh, Tulane, yep. and Mavis Washington, who played Swish, um, I forget where she played at, but she but she played, was like the greatest woman. She basketball played collegiate basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, played collegiate basketball. So we had, we had a grand time. Yeah, um, and then you were in Miami Vice with Bill Russell. You know that was fun. We spent uh, a week and a half in uh, in Miami Beach. Bill you Russell know. was like a judge. Yeah, he was a judge, and I was his son, and. Uh, Don Johnson, Philip Michael Thomas, Miami Vice, they came to me as a son saying that your dad is corrupt, he's on the take, and can you talk to him? And they'd seen your acting from Fast Break, so they knew they knew you could handle this part. Yeah, and I was injured at the time with the Knicks, so yeah, yeah. I, I, I was available. So I call Bill Russell to this day, hey, Dad, how you doing, <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I see him. But we had a wonderful time together. So is that those were only two? Yeah, those were only two. I never pursued it, never hired an agent. Or, or anything like that. And just took it for what it was and enjoyed that and concentrated on playing basketball. What's your biggest regret about your career? Not playing with Patrick. Not playing with Patrick Ewing. Because um, I believe if Patrick and I had teamed together, Bill, yeah. we, we would have won a championship. And I was in, 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 in Gila on my honeymoon um, 20 years ago with my wife. And we're laying on the beach. You know, I figured nobody knows me here, right? Yeah. We're in Anguilla. And I hear this voice. Not. I said, oh, no, that's, I know that voice. <laughs> of Patrick Ewing. And I yeah. turned around, it's Patrick. And you know who's coming up behind him? Alonzo Mourning. And behind Alonzo, Matumbo. <laughs> and Alonzo was getting married at the same resort we were staying at. 
And so they were there for his uh, his oh, wedding wow. cer his wedding ceremony. But I never forget what what Patrick said to uh, Matumbo. Bernard and I played together. Would kick your butt. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I intimated to him that you know I if we had played, I thought we would have won the championship together. That's my only regret. That jam session poster that's behind you. Yeah. That Another one of memories. our favorite favorite posters. It's basically every great player from I don't know seventy nine, nineteen eighty, somewhere in there. Yeah, that was the Nike Club. Right. And uh, we shot that in, in, in Vegas. And, you okay, know, so you remember that. So you're no, in yeah, I remember that. All you guys are in Vegas. Yeah, we're all in Vegas for Nike um, just to represent the company and to have a good time together as, as a group. We ordered, the, you know, for Nike, the chosen ones by, by Nike. And they were going to give us stock bill in the company. And can you imagine if we got stock in, in that company in its infancy? Yeah. And so they decided not to do the stock and to give us contracts instead. I would prefer so you to have the stock. They paid at the time, you were probably happier with the money, though. Oh, yeah. You know, it was very good money at the yeah. time. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was tremendous. So then you have, you have those two up there, too. Yeah. yeah I, like the, the, I think that the might be... my brother and I. And yeah, there's only two brothers posters. You and the Williams brothers. I think yeah, are the only Gus, two brothers Gus, posters. Ray and, Les Ray's, unfortunately, he passed. So you, got, you don't have any stories from the jam session photo shoot? No, no, other than the fact that, you know, we were all talking basketball. and Are there know, 40 girls in the background that we can't see? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, we had to uh, meet the ladies on our own, which, which uh, we certainly did. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that was a grand time, and we played golf, and I play at golf. I'm not a golfer yeah, yeah, yeah. at all. In fact, I'm going to Naples, Florida after the All-Star break uh, for the Hall of Fame Golf Classic in Florida. Who's the, who's the biggest character in that poster? Moses? I, I played with Moses in Washington. Moses was, was fantastic. That Washington team was pretty good. Yeah, we, 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 we had a good team. We just didn't, you know, it's all about chemistry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and the, and the chemistry. I'm not sure you and Moses together, that, that makes kind of two, two guys that need the ball. Well, he was the most unselfish guy I've ever played. With. Really? Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to just fit in, and to me, in my mind, it was Moses' team when I arrived, yeah. and that's how I treated it. But I'll never forget, uh, first few games, uh, I, I, I would get the ball, and I'm looking to dump it inside to Moses. And Moses said, no, 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 B, 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 you take it. No, you take it. And he said just consistently because he wanted me to take it. That's where I'm effective at from that yeah, yeah. position. He's the most unselfish guy I've ever played with. Great, great basketball player. One of the best ever to ever lace up his shoes. And, you know, I'm going to see a lot of these guys here uh, during, during well, All-Star Week. That's why I love All-Star Weekend is they're so, they welcome all the legends back. And it's yeah. fun to see you guys interact. we got to go because we've got more legends coming up. No, absolutely. I'm doing a panel discussion with Ernie Johnson and Julius Irving. And, oh, beautiful. Uh, and Nate Archie Ball doing that. And I'm, I'm a judge for the Slam Dunk Contest. Nice. Yeah, my daughter just got me on social media. And so uh, hit me up at Bernard King, capital H-O-F. Twitter. Beautiful. <laughs> she set that up for me a couple of days ago, Bill. Excellent. Hey, listen, it's a joy. It's, yeah, you're, listen. I watch you all the time, and you're a delight, and you're just great at what you do, so thanks for having me. Thank you. You're the only Nick I ever liked. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from a true Celtic man. <laughs> More to come from New York after this. NBA All-Star Weekend continues in New York City. Daryl Dawkins from one of my least favorite teams, the 1981 Philadelphia 76ers. Oh, you fixed me to get teams. hurt, man. You fixed me to get hurt. Come on. Your least favorite team? Well, I'm one of them, yeah. I'm a Celtic fan. I went to those games. Those were wars. Uh, can we get security to get them out of here? <laughs> you know, that, that's, I can't believe that, man. That's terrible. Those were wars. You guys didn't we like did, each we other. We had a battle every time. Yeah. But you don't see that now. The good no. rivalries where guys just get up to play against each other. And it's nip and tuck the whole game. But you know what the fans don't understand? You're out there beating, bumping, and banging a guy. And after it's over, hey, man, come on, let's go out. I right. said, but y'all hate each other. Nah, that's just our job. Just being competitive. <laughs> that's what we do. That's our job. Right. What, how long did you play? Like, like 14, 15 years? I played uh, 14 years in the NBA before uh, going overseas to let them see a real ball player. <laughs> And uh, spent about six, seven years in Italy, a couple years in Hong Kong, one in the Philippines, two years with the Globetrotters, uh, and a couple in Canada. 
Because you, I mean, you were one of the first high school to NBA dudes. So, I, I, no, I 14 years, you're in your early first. 30s. I, did, I was the first. I thought Moses was first. Moses, that's where they kill you on the trivia pursuit question. They say, who's the first guy to go to the NBA from high school? And oh, because Moses say, went to ABA. Everybody say, I got this thing right now, Moses. I'm looking at him. So, so well, they say, uh, Moses. I said, nah, me. They said, how come you didn't give me the answer? I said, that's cheating. <laughs> I only cheat on board games. <laughs> so that was it. Well, if you'd gone to college, where would you have gone? You know, I was between Kentucky and uh, Florida State. Right. One or the other. I was going to either stay near mom or go all the way away. So if you had to do it over again, what would you do? I'd take the money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you ended exactly up on a great team. You ended up on a, on a Sixers team, the same, I think the same year Dr. J showed up, which was nice. Dr. J showed up mid-year. We had George McGinnis. Yeah. Um, Joe Bryant, Kobe's father, World Be Free, uh, Doug Collins, Henry Bibby. Uh, we, we, we had some real guys, some dudes on that team, man. So I worked with Doug Collins for a year. He's good. told me some good stories about that team. Yeah. That, yeah, team, that team missed, it, missed its era. The internet would have loved that team. Ooh. There was a lot going on with that team. We'd have been all over the place by now. I'm, I'm glad Twitter and Facebook wasn't around me. <laughs> Because all of us would have been locked up by now, man. <laughs> but we had a good time. We really did. A fun era to be in the NBA, too, the late 70s. Well, you know, it, it was a game. And you always taught a game. It's fun. Now it's become business. And when it got to be business, guys say, oh, man, I got to go to work. We look like, hey, man, only had one game on on Sundays. If you had that game, you was the man. Right. And we stayed on a lot of Sundays. In Boston. L.A., Portland, they say, how come we don't see none of the other teams? They don't entertain people as well as we do. <laughs> so we had a good time with that. And that was a ridiculously talented team. You know what? It, it was so talented, we probably needed two basketballs. Right. George was going to get his 20 shots in. Uh, Dr. J was going to get his 20. World B. Free was going to get his 19. And Steve Mix, he'll go down there, he'll get his 14 in. And I got and a couple five, elbows. five shots a game. Yeah, he, he go down to Mitchfield. He can give it to anybody. I got five shots a game. Yeah. And uh, I had to make four of him. Right. Or you didn't have no stats. Because if you miss the first one, they say, we ain't giving it to him no more. What was it? I mean, you're learning how to play center. And you're learning how to play center in an era that had some major dudes. Like, all of a you sudden, know, you're, you're defending Kareem and Bill Walton. Like, these were some of the greatest ever. Yeah, they were. But when they first drafted me, they said... You're going to play big forward. I said, okay. I mean, I like facing the basket. First game, I went for like 26, 27. Caldwell Jones got poked in the eye. He moved me over the center. Yeah. And I went for 30. And Gene Shu said, you're a center. And that's where you're going to stay. Right. But playing against guys like Nate Thurman, Wes Unsell, Elvin Hayes, Kareem, Elmo Smith. Hey, man, it was a lot of bumping and banging. The, the guy I had more trouble with was Bob Lanier. Oh, the little lefty, little little, little, little hunk, the little yeah, hunk. Yeah, he, he was left-handed, cross-eyed, <laughs> and you could he, you get right in front of him, you didn't know which way he was going to go. <laughs> but he had that button in his side that if you kept behind him, he pushed the button, his butt got big and you couldn't get around him. Yeah, Bob, Bob was, uh, he was hard to guard, I'm telling you. So in the 77 finals, you get in a fight with Maurice Lucas. Yes. Which was like a real, like you guys like squared up and you did this whole thing. And you, you know, I, I got uh, so mad with my team because I'm taking a poke at um, Bobby Gross. And Doug Collins' head come up. So you hit Doug Collins. Pop Doug Collins. His head hit Bobby Gross. And while I'm squared up with him, Lucas comes running across the floor to the back of the head. Right. Turn around, we squared up. And I'm saying, I, man, I'm playing with a bunch of guys that don't even look out for each other. Right. Turn around, Doc's sitting on the floor being Doc, he cool. George is on the bench because, you know, he had smoked too many Winstons. He's, <laughs> he's over there. My brothers came out of the crowd. They was like, we can't find him. Where is he? Where is he? That was, a, that, that was basketball, man. That, that's, that was love. 
But that was game two of the finals. Yeah. Imagine if that happened now. That happened now, you lose a paycheck. But yeah. We got fined by 1500 So Colin said you were so mad afterwards that you barricaded yourself in the locker room and you wouldn't let anyone come in. I barricaded. You might have destroyed a couple of things and you wouldn't let the team come in the locker room. That was Is bad that true? Too. That was bad. So I mean, that's true. Wouldn't let them in, pull a latrine off the wall, turn over everybody's lockers. You know, guys came back in. They gave the shoes a floating in the water, and they're like, hey, man, that's my suit. That's... But they looked at me, and I was so mad. They said, hey, man, you better just let them go now. It took them two weeks to say, hey, man, my shoes was in that water. Man. You know, my coat was in there. Well, I said, well, you know what? When somebody get in a fight, you supposed to let somebody know if somebody coming behind them. Right. And nobody did. The only guy that was helping me was the world be free. Interesting. That's my brother. Well, Collins was in there. You just punched him. Yeah, well, he wasn't helping nobody. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have been better if he just scratched somebody in the end, like a cat, you know. But, uh, I mean, we, we was a real close team. We hung out together. We uh, went to cookouts together. We was over each other's house. And I don't see a lot of that now in the NBA. You, know, you got to live on the block, and he have a party. Another guy's a block down. He don't invite nobody to his party. I said, no, what, what kind of team is that? Well, it seems like everybody now has their own entourage. They don't need the team. Yeah, you got I, your four I, or five buddies, and that's who you hang out with. I had enough brothers. I had six brothers, four sisters. You had six brothers? Yeah, I'm one of 11. So was, it, was that kind of your personal entourage? Yeah. That was it until they could not pass school. They went to Camden County. Yeah. And when they didn't get through there, it was like, see ya. You got to go home. Because I tried to put all of them through college. Right. And you, you had, obviously after the backboard, you broke a couple backboards. It no, became a, a little bit iconic. Accident. First one was an accident. What does that mean? It was an accident. I didn't know that was going to happen. Oh, second one was not an accident. Absolutely not. So after you did the first one, you were going for the second one. I went for the third one, too. <laughs> How many were there? Um, I thought there were two. Two in the NBA, uh, two in practice, and about three or four in Italy. But they loved it in Italy. Right. You break the back, but they run out and grab a hand full of glass, the hands bleed, and they're like, oh. I was like, <laughs> whoa, whack holes, man. But I enjoyed it. I had a good time with them. Why didn't that Sixers team win a title? What happened? Simple. And people got to understand basketball. If you know basketball, you got Bill Walton, who's a great center. He's surrounded by Lionel Hollins, Johnny Davis, Bobby Gross, Lloyd Neal, um, Lucas. Lucas. He, all he had to do was pass the ball around, and when you thought he was going to pass, he shot. Now, they played a good team game. Bobby Gross wasn't supposed to get busy like he got busy, but Doc said his knees was bothering him. Yeah. George McGinnis probably shot four for 24. Um, it, they, they was just a, a good, well-glued team. Where Unselfish. we needed two balls. First right. guy got it, shot it. That's where we were. And there was kind of a narrative that came out of that final. I was like, Portland plays the right way. And you have this other team and everybody's selfish. And it felt like a yeah, little bit well, racist, right? That's kind, of, that's kind of white and black ball. Yeah. You know, white guy go off the screen, get his toes together, and point it, shoot it. Black guy, he want to fly over everybody and dunk it, don't pass it. I said, whoa, man, we wide open. I had the shot. They paid to see me. But you guys, it was iconic for the black basketball fans at the time because you had Doc, who was mm -hmm. like the guy. Mm -hmm. And then you had all these other, like, you know, you'd yourself, you'd Lloyd Free, now World B Free. World B. You call him Lloyd, man. Check. You got to fight. Right. You got to fight on your hands. You call him that. But he was one of the all time heat check guys. Man, he, he, he was the highest jumping guard I'd ever seen. Yeah. He would jump so high while he's shooting. Guy be running at him, he'd stick his leg over there and hit him, and they'd say, oh, you foul him, and he make the shot. So if he was wide open and he came off and got the ball and got backed up, he said, no, come out here and take it like a man. And guy would go running out on him, he put some stuff on him, bang him out. I mean, he was like... He missed his error. The three-point line, the way they use the three-point line now, I feel like would have been good for him. Yeah, it would have been great. I remember the first night he shot the rainbow shot from about 30 feet. Yeah. And he hit it. Then he came down and he hit two more. Gene Shu and Jack McManon, they knew me and World lived together. We were like brothers. You lived together with Lloyd Free? 
How would, is that not a TV show? Oh, it, it would have been a TV show today. <laughs> but they, he was shooting that shot, and then, uh, Gene told Jack, go tell him to quit screwing around and shoot the ball right. Yeah. So Jack said, hey, um, will you go tell World that um, Gene said, quit screwing around and shoot the ball right? I said, well, they said shoot it right. He said, you go back and you tell them, this is my shot. So I went back and told him, and he kept making them, and they left him alone. You guys didn't like Gene Shue that much. No, Gene Shue was a good coach. Gene Shue uh, liked to control everything. and um, You didn't like best... Gene Shue that much. Wasn't crazy about him. I mean, <laughs> uh, I wasn't going to invite him to cook out, but you know, he, he was a, a pretty good coach. He was. All right. All right. And uh, he tried to keep everything together. Greatest thing about him is we had a team meeting, and he told Henry Bibby, he said, uh, Henry, get on the phone, order some snacks for the guys while we're watching film. Bad move. Yeah. yeah. Henry called down on the shrimp, lobster tail, <laughs> steak, everything. It was like $1,500. Gene Shoe would say, Henry, what would you do? He said, you told me to order? I ordered. Well, what I didn't never let him near the phone again. <laughs> what I didn't realize until I spent a year with, with Coach Collins mm -hmm. was that Henry Bibby was the secret great character on that team. Yeah. Henry, <laughs> well, we call him Deep Basket. Henry was, he could get it in, let's put it that way. <laughs> if you could be in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, out on a little piece of land like that, he'd find a girl. Right. <laughs> like, okay, oh, I'm, oh, I'm glad you went there because yeah. I, I wasn't going to bring it up unless you did. No, yeah. you didn't. Henry, it ain't no secret, man. Henry, uh, yeah, because everyone would have assumed that, like Dr. J or so, like one of the famous guys in the team. But no, it was Henry Bibby. Henry it was the Bibby. legend. Henry Bibby would find one from the car rental girl, all the way to the hotel waitress, the room service girl. Henry, why you ask all them girls? Because one of them might want to get busy. So, so his he's, odds was good. So he's a volume shooter. Yeah. He's getting a lot shoot, of shots shoot up. Shoot often, one of them may go in. So he, <laughs> he, was, he was a fun teammate, man. He really was. He sounds like it. I can't believe nobody's written a book about that team. Well, Just from uh, a year with I, Collins, I heard 700 pages of stories. Yeah. And we got Chuck Daly that came in. And uh, Chuck oh, I Daly. I forgot about Chuck Daly. I used to have to go to his house the fried chicken because his wife Terry couldn't fry chicken. And so you wanted, had to fry the chicken for him? I went over there and fried the chicken for him. And can we yeah. go back to George McGinnis smoking cigarettes at halftime? Oh, man. He smoked that, cigarettes that, at halftime. That was a whole different era. Right. And I, I, I always tell the story. Right? You go in the locker room, man, it's halftime. Everybody's sitting down. The coach is screaming and howling. And Joe Bryant reached over and picked up a coop. <sighs> <laughs> George Gravel Winston. I went, look around, so, so I'll get up, go over there to the beer. <laughs> Pop a beer and Gene says, hey, hey, we don't do that at halftime. So you got to tell me because he's smoking, he's smoking, he's smoking, <laughs> I'm drinking. You have a bartender in the locker yeah, room? Yeah, yeah, we had a, a whole case of that Schaefer's beer. Mm. Oh, Lord, I wouldn't drink that the day to save your life. It so, was terrible. In the late 70s was kind of a rowdy era, just mm -hmm. in general. It like was. Recreational drugs, nobody knew they were bad yet. You had. Oh, you knew they were bad. Like, you just had to do You didn't know they were that bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you knew they were bad. You said, man, uh, anything you got to sneak and do in the dark, you know it's wrong. That's a good quote. I like that. Yeah, you know it's wrong. Anything you but have to sneak and do in the dark, you know it's wrong. You I know like that. it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we was having so much fun, we forgot uh, that it was illegal. So how bad, like, there's always varying reports about how much cocaine in the league and all that stuff and how, how much of an effect it had on people. How much, of, like, could you tell in other teams? You'd be like, uh-oh, that guy's are, in are trouble. You, you know, it took a duel to know a duel. Right. So, I mean, you could see guys and say, oh, we ain't worried about him tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We ain't worried about him tonight. He ain't got nothing tonight. True enough, that night the guy said, man, my leg hurt, man. My leg, right. my arm hurt, yeah. It, it, it was just a different era, and, um, you know, when you're growing up, you go through all, everything. Thank God you lived to talk about it. Right. But we, we did have a lot of fun. Did we, they, and it was a little under the radar, too, because, like, nowadays, these guys can't even go out, really. 
Especially well, they you got the camera phones. And thank God iPhones. for no Twitter and yeah. Facebook and all that. We went out and had a ball. And some of the stuff we probably did, if we would have got on Twitter, right. we, we'd have been in trouble. Right. But we didn't have that then. So um, it was like, you shut up, you shut up, and you shut up. And the veterans would always tell us when we rookies, you guys can't go out with us. We said, why? Because y'all talk too much. Don't talk too much, man. What you mean? You don't want us to see who you at. Now, y'all talk too much. And what happens is you see him, and you go home, you're talking to your girl. Yeah, yeah. She said, well, if they was with somebody, who was you with? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Guilt by association. You didn't realize you had already opened the can of worms. Right. Yeah. Um, Dr. J the the late 70s who comes from the ABA is this mm-hmm. legend nobody even knows how good he is because those games weren't even on TV I did and then his knees were bugging him pretty much off and on and then all of a sudden they weren't bugging him but he took a lot of crap though one of those seasons for not being as great as everybody thought right well Doc uh, when he first came in he didn't have a jump shot yep I mean everything was flying to the goal of finger roll and they say hey just back up don't let him fly in there play him five feet off yeah right? but after about three years, he developed a little jumper off the backboard, and that made him even more dangerous. But um, as a leader and as an explosive guy, first guy I ever saw with air brakes, that he could be going this way and start going that way and never put his foot down. Right. Doc, he, he was the man. Did your generation, is it safe to say your generation, revered him and what he meant to the league and all that stuff? He was... I, I, I put it this way. Michael Jordan game wouldn't be where it is yep. if he didn't watch Doc. And Doc game wouldn't be where it was if he didn't watch Connie Hawkins. Because they all had the big hand moves. Legacy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Connie to Doc to MJ. Yeah. To, I would say, maybe Vince for a couple yeah, of years like, anyway. Yeah, Vince, Vince, he brought the noise for a while. Yeah. But, you know, guys that have big hands, you could trick them all the time. You could start with the right and the guy jump. You can put it left, bam, right in his mouth. What was the most vicious dunk you ever did on somebody's head? Well, every, everybody thinks that the uh, bank boy was uh, vicious, but that was an accident, the first one. Yeah. But I like when there's three guys under there and all of them getting ready to jump, and you go over them and throw it in on them, bam, say, your mama. Right. So my your mama dunk on a rim record was my favorite dunks. So who, so who is the best victim? What was your favorite video? Anybody under the go. You, you could have put Andre the Giant under there. I was still going to dunk. It didn't matter. You put anybody under there, they might, like my new bowl, 7 6, they say, ah, oh, he's a shot blocker. So let me see if he can block this one. <laughs> but he was about that thin. So right. thank God I had some beef. Lean on him there. Bam! I, we was playing Washington. Gene Shue was coaching him. And my new bowl was playing. Say, Manute, you take Daryl. So he's got me. And I'm down there. I'm backing him in. You running out of time, dude? Yeah, they were. Okay. I'm backing him down in. Back him in. I lay it up. And Manute's trying to block it. Back him in on the other side. Lay it up. He's trying to block it. Dunk on him. Gene Shoe says, time out. Manute, you can't guard him. You can't guard him. I say, oh, Gene, you can't guard me either. <laughs> Because we talk trash. Right. So come back out of the huddle. Manute's out there. And I shake him. And you know if you shake him and cock it back, he can reach over and get it. I shook him and put it in front. And bam! And Gene Shu said, that's it. Manute, you're coming out. He said, Coach, him too damn fat for me. Him too damn fat. Him too damn heavy for me. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you can't handle me, boy. But he he was a shot like a machine. Last question. Who was the best player you ever played against? Woo! Best player I ever played against. Since I played, you mean at center position or? Just other team. Guy on the other team who was the best you ever saw. Uh, George Gervin. The Iceman. Interesting. He'd have 35, wouldn't even be sweating. Right. You didn't yeah. even know he had 35. <clears throat> he told Mo Cheeks one night, he was backing him in. 
He said, Mo, you like a, a little patch. You like a, a spray. At, <laughs> Damn, he's like, oh, man, that dude cool, man. Ice is the man. Yeah, he, he, he probably the best. When I, we had Celtics season tickets, so I would only get, they, those guys were never on TV. He would just come like once a year and it'd be like, who is this guy? How did he just score 45 points? I don't remember half of them. Well, you know, the West wasn't uh, so physical. Right. We was the beast from the East. They yep. were the best from the West. They didn't touch each other. We believed in beating and grinding you the whole game. So when they came in, everybody said, where these guys been? Well, you know, these in the West, uh, they wasn't televised so much. But when people got a chance to see him more, they realized, hey, th- this guy can go. The Iceman, George Gervin, interesting. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, that made me excited. Uh, we're wrapping it up here with Daryl Dawkins. Okay. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. That was great. My uh, pleasure. Back with more stuff in New York after this. VS Report All-Star Weekend. This is our final guest of the weekend. 81 finals champion. Boston Celtic, Nate Tiny Archibald, New York City legend. How are you? I'm, I'm fine. Glad to be here. I went to all those games because we had season tickets. <laughs> Came back from 3-1, Philly. Yeah. One of the great series that everybody forgets now because it was 34 years ago. Yeah. But uh, a classic. The different, I was telling these guys before you came in, like the, this was like pre-three-point line. Like You watch basketball now and like the slash and kick and everything's about getting people threes. Yeah. You used to start the offense at the foul line. You, you, your handle would come all the way down. You take the back the guy down to the foul line, and that's where the offense started. But, but I was a penetrator. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you go back to into history, the Boston Celtics wasn't a great shooting team back then. But right. when the three-point shot came in, I got the first assist because Chris Ford yeah. hit the first shot. But that wasn't a big thing in my game because I was the penetrator. Yes. And... I was fortunate and lucky because of Red Allback kind of put me in that position because I tell kids now and they laugh about it. I said, you have an entrance and you have an exit. I said, I was on my way out the exit. Okay. But Red saw something in me yeah. and you know, my career is almost over. And he said, I need somebody to lead. Yeah. And, you know, you know, growing up in, in New York, and I'm kind of glad that the All-Star game is here yeah. because the NBA put out a map about New York City basketball history and gave different directions of guys going to high school, college, but more importantly, growing up in, in, in New York City. But going up to, 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 you know, to Boston and people always say, why you never played with the team on 33rd Street? Yeah, they never asked. Well, I wasn't fortunate and lucky, and sometimes I tell kids about making the right choices, and taking chances. They didn't take a chance on number seven yeah. when I was with, with the Celtics. But it was a good, to me, career. It was exciting to play with, you know, Larry and Kevin and, and Robert. But my best friend was Cedric Maxwell. We, like, we, we were like brothers. Finals MVP. Yeah, we were, like, we, we were like brothers. And to say all of that, the camaraderie that, after that, not the championship, because people say, oh, you won the chip." Before the championship, before Larry and them came, and when they came up until now, the camaraderie will, will last forever, even though we don't talk to each other and we don't right. see each but other. But when you see each other, it's probably great, We right? just smile. Yeah. Because I tell people, there's, you know, because Larry's with corporate, but playing on that court, I tell people that was like in the service, being in the trenches, because we were on a mission, like everybody else. Our, our, our enemy or the people that we wanted to beat was Philadelphia. Yeah. Okay. And when we played them in the regular season, that was like, to me, a playoff game. But the game was better for me. And I tell people that, was the pro game good? I said the high school and, and, and college game, to me, was more enjoyable because it wasn't about a check. It was about learning getting that experience, and unfortunately, there's a lot of guys who played before me that are not playing now because, like Oscar and Jerry, yep. they would have probably made a gazillion dollars. But it wasn't about the check. It was about me going to school first because I tell kids I wasn't a good student, okay? And you become a student athlete early on, and I struggled in school. I have an undergrad degree, 
okay, which I'm proud of. And people say, well, talk about, and that's what you want to do, talk about, you know, the NBA career. NBA was, was good, but growing up here, playing high school and college basketball was the greatest experience for me because nobody ever thought I was going to play in the NBA anyway, all right? right? And, I, and I got a chance. I grew up in the projects in Is the South Is that really Bronx. true? Nobody thought you were going to play in the NBA? I, I, I believe that. Yeah. Okay, and that was a... Ch- I thought you were like a legend, though. That, no, I was son, not. No? And that was a challenging experience for me to go out and prove to the experts. First of all, it started in high school because I didn't make my high school team and wasn't on my high school team until I was a senior, okay? Really? And we won. We didn't lose any games that year. And I went back to D. with Clinton, and the kids was, oh, you was a star. I said, see that, see that team up there? I'm proud to say I was a member of that team that didn't didn't lose a game. Yeah. And they're looking at the so-called finished accomplishment that you played in the NBA. And maybe none of those other guys did, but they're like, you was a star. And I was not. Then I went on to Arizona Western, and then I went on to Texas Western, which became the University of Texas El Paso. And I tell kids that when you follow that track, it wasn't a success story all the way. Yeah. I struggled because I tell them that when I went to Arizona Western, Yuma, Arizona, was a border town. Okay, I thought it was in a foreign country. Then I went on to Texas Western, which became University of Texas El Paso. The border town was Juarez. I thought I was in another foreign country. Okay, because I, growing up here, I thought the only thing that was in the country was New York City. Yeah. Okay. Manhattan. I, I go to Manhattan. I go to Brooklyn. I go to Queens. Seeking out competition. You say legend. I don't know about. I fit in that category. I played against some legends who never played in the NBA. Yeah. But it was just great growing up. And I'm glad that the All Star Game is here because the NBA gave people, and especially in the school system, some maps of the the journeys that some of us went to high school, college. You're talking about maybe 500 so-called, like you said, legends, coaches, players, mentors. We talk about the Wrens. We talk about the Harlem Globetrotters. And when we talk about that, I think about, you know, and we'll play with the Harlem Globetrotters, but there was a guy who was on the so-called cartoons with the Harlem Globetrotters that went to D with Clinton, okay? His name's Pablo Robinson, yeah. okay? And we have so many guys that went there and people, oh, you went to D with Clinton, you was the man. I went to D with Clinton, I was one of the many players that got out and went on to higher education. But I look at Dolph Shays, you know, Tommy Henderson, Ricky Sobers, Butch Lee, you know, Ron Behagen. I can go on and on. We probably have more guys, okay, out of one high school, because Brooklyn got the most, Yeah. okay, as far as NBA and ABA players. But one high school probably has more guys than anybody else in the history of New York State coming out of one high school, NBA, ABA, and Globetrotters. So we always hear about the New York City point guard, the legend of the New York City point guard. You were always one of the first ones mentioning that and just goes on down the line. And then the next time there's a great one, it's like, oh, the legacy, Marbury, the legacy, Kenny Anderson way back when, the legacy, Telfair, the legacy. Was that the case when you were coming up, or did that start after you? It, it was before me. Okay. I could name two guys, and I could keep on going. Right, right, I, right. I, I look at Lenny Wilkins, yep. Bob Cousy. Okay, and people say, well, they're not street. <laughs> yeah, especially Cousy. Yeah. <laughs> they grew up in New York. Yeah. I call them legends. Yep. Whether you put them in the street legends or just legends, I look at legends. I looked at Lenny early on before he went to Providence, those guys used to play all over. Yeah. Soul in the hole. Dude, they, they, and people talk about the Rucker Tournament. The Rucker Tournament wasn't on 55th Street all the time. Oh, the Rucker Tournament on 50, oh, come on. It was on 127th Street. They played different places, okay? But Brooklyn had the, the most guys. I look at the, the legends of Brooklyn and the guys at the top 50. I look at Lenny Wilkins. <laughs> You look at Billy Cunningham, because nobody talks about Erasmus. When we were growing up, Erasmus and boys, now it's called boys and girls, because they have girls, was our enemies, okay? Because when we came out of the Bronx, there was nobody in, in Manhattan that could beat us and nobody in Queens. So we were, our target was Brooklyn schools, 
Okay, and I didn't play against. So you hated Brooklyn back then. <laughs> I, I didn't like him at all. <laughs> but Lenny was gone. Yeah. Okay, and Billy was gone. But Brooklyn always had some some tough teams. And today, you know, when people say, "Well, you're representing the Bronx," Brooklyn had the toughest schedule. They played more competitive basketball than any other borough. But you know, when you talk about the legends of, of, of basketball, it's all over the city, even Staten Island. Well, what is it about the New York City game? And, and maybe, I don't know if it's a legacy thing or if it's the wind's blowing, so everybody's just got to go to the hole, but everybody's got a handle, and everybody can finish, and everybody goes to the basket. So is that like a legacy thing that you just learned from the previous generation, or are there other reasons that I wouldn't know I, I, about? To, to me, I, I thought and I felt it was a great outlet. You played, you practiced hard. I used to go from the Bronx, yeah. Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, and try to seek out competition. You know, we played in, in basically in the Bronx, citywide. You're always and, and, outdoors, right? And, always. And, and always. In the summertime, it was outdoors. Yeah, yeah. And I know guys regret it now because guys got the bad knees, oh, yeah. the bad hips and stuff like that. But I thought it was just the competition was fierce here, just like it is now in Chicago, yeah. Detroit, out in California. But it was just... Fierce competition, but we had people put us in that place where it kept us out of trouble. Uh, to me, right. the game was a safe haven because we had a lot of guys, and we, I'm not going to name them, we had a lot of guys growing up in New York that were part of the gangs. Right. Okay, but when you talk about putting, uh -huh. a, not, and people say uniform, to putting a t shirt on somebody to represent that team and going out there with a coach, and I'm going to name one guy because to me he was a disciplinarian from Brooklyn, Gil Reynolds. Yeah. He was in the service, and he had Fly Williams, Bernard King, World Be Free. He had all of them guys. And I'm t when we played against them guys, not Bernard, but World Be and Fly, and I'm like, how he gets those guys to play for him? You talk about legacy, it goes way back then when he had Roger Brown and Connie Hawkins and them guys, and he wasn't that much older than them guys. But it was the persona that he brought to the coaching that he was a no-nonsense guy, and he would slap you upside your head, right. okay, if you didn't do the right things on the court. But the discipline that he brought to the game was the same discipline that I felt I got from Floyd Lane and Hilton White and those guys. And they put me in, uh, I call it a safe haven because I was part of the community center, even though basketball in New York it's always played outdoors. Yeah. Most of the places indoors are, are closed. But it put me in a safe haven. But I, I'm proud to say that if I weren't part of that community center, I would I wouldn't I wouldn't be here today. Say it's it's it saved me. And I was I don't know about a lot of guys, but I was intrigued about the game because yeah. I knew nothing about the game. You know, when I look at some of the young guys, the talent base is off the charts. The ability to play is off the charts. But early on, and people say, well, he was a great player. I don't know if you could describe greatness in me, okay? I was a hard worker, all right? Sure. Well, you had, the, you had the best handle I've ever seen in my life, though. But I'm, I mean, I'm that's saying, a natural gift. I, 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 and it began with the fundamentals. Yeah. Who could have said that I would have been, been an NBA player? Nobody, okay? But it's the work that you put in, and it was positive work, but I got a chance to go to school. Yep. There's a lot of guys that are coming out now should stay in school, all right, because when we were playing, there wasn't an outlet like that. You talk, you could name a guy, and there wasn't no ESPNs, okay, one, two, threes, no ESPN U's, yeah, yeah. no TNTs, and people say, well, what was the network like? It was 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13, okay? And the games that I saw growing up, and that's how I, naive I was about the game. I thought it was only two teams in the league. <laughs> yeah, okay? it was that was the Boston the Celtics and the Lakers. Because yeah. the only games they showed was on Sunday. Yeah. And the kids don't believe that. That's the only game. We didn't have the network like you have now. Yeah. I said, and when you watch teams play back then, the Bulls and Detroit, and I was infatuated with Lenny, okay, when he was coaching and he was, before he was coaching, he was playing because – 
left-handed, smooth, getting into the lane. So that was your guy. I said, man, if I could play like him, I could make my high school and college team. I wasn't thinking about the dream team yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm watching him, and I I love the way he, you know, handles, run the team and stuff like that. And Lenny could score. And and that dream became a reality because I got a chance to play against some of them guys that was on my dream team. The difference between then and now is the videotape or the DVD was in your head, okay? Now yeah. you could go watch games over, video games, DVD games, send it to your friend, email it. We didn't have that type of technology back then. So what you did, like now, I tell kids like now, I go out on my dream court and there's snow on the court. How are you going to remove the snow? You're going to get either a shovel or you're going to take, put some gloves on and remove a small portion of that and ab live your dreams, okay? It's not like are you watching, I, I, and my, my grandson beats the crap out of me, okay, with the video games. Yeah. I said, I'm going to put you <laughs> over there. And I said, well, I can't play that game. I said, but if you go outside or we go in the gym and I don't play that much anymore, I could beat you because right. I could break you down. Okay, he broke me down. He wouldn't let me score. Um, in, I think you showed up in the Celtics late 70s. You're coming off of Achilles injury. I ever thought your career might be over. Yeah. You came back from it, got your, got your mojo back. Bird shows up. In the training camp for that title team, you had you, Hall of Fame, Bird, Mikhail Parrish, all Hall of Fame, and then Callens and Maravich were in training camp. It's six Hall of Famers. Right. And then Cowens, Maravich ended up, he retired. Yeah, he retired. And then Cowens on the bus tells you guys, I've run out of steam, that's it. But yeah. that had to, was there one game where you were like, oh my God, this is, this is like an all-star game? No, because you, you know, I, was, I was coming back. Those guys, except for maybe Pete, because that was Pete's last team. People, yeah. oh, he retired from, no. He was with the Celtics. Yep. He wasn't in good health. No. I was coming back from an injury, and I'm going to tell you a little story. Nate Archibald, all his life, weighed about, when I got in college, I weighed about 155. NBA, I gained a little weight. Food was better. I had a little little more money in my pocket so I could buy a little more food. Probably weighed about 170, 175. I came back off of that injury. I weighed 245. 245? 245. Wow. I was, I was thinking maybe I was going out to uh, either the Giants or the Jets or the Patriots <laughs> to, to, to play a little football, but I couldn't play football because I never did. Yeah. I went to Red's office, and I know there's no smoking in this building anymore, but it was smoke-filled and stuff like that. Red said, I'm taking a chance on you. We need somebody to lead. We don't need you to score. I couldn't score anyway. We don't need you to score. We just need Hold somebody on, though, but you, to score. You, you did score 35 a game one year. I mean, yeah, you, but that was, in early, that, that was early 70s. Yeah, okay. We're talking about late 70s, late 70s coming early, back yeah. from, from, from multiple injuries. But before I tore that Achilles, I broke my fifth metatarsal bone in my left foot. Then I went up to Buffalo and severed my Achilles in, in, in my right foot. And I felt my career is over. The best thing that happened to Nate Archibald went back to New York. I was running a league. I run, I run leagues all year round. Yeah. In the summertime, one of the kids said, you're going to come back. I looked at the little kid, and I'm like, what? He said, you're going to be back. That was a blessing for me because the kid never seen me play. I don't believe he never saw me play. He know that I was running this program. That gave me so much incentive. So I you were started, almost out of the league. Almost out. Wow. Because you were great, and I mean... We win in 80. I don't know how to spell greatness. I don't know if you know, but I was on the team. Right. Uh, we almost win in 82. You separate your shoulder, and right. I think game three or game four, yeah. nobody remembers that that was our title. I and know. I told Magic I, that, Magic got mad. But I, we I, beat I, them I, in 82. I got, I got, I got blamed for that. But well, just, it wasn't your fault. But just coming back, I think, and giving that encouragement from a little kid yeah, yeah, yeah. G- g- gave me that incentive. But Red, who is, I tell people, Red all back. The master. He had guys that, like you just said, they was on the exit. I yeah. mean, we was on that exit line. 
He said, we need somebody to lead. And he'd been doing that for 30 years. That's yeah. how he got all those yeah. wrestlers, like going back to Willie Knowles and guys like right. that. When, when did you know Bird was great? In exhibition season. Because you know you hear... First preseason? You, 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 before, let me say before Larry. Clint Eastwood had a, a Western called the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. Before Larry got there, the team was ugly. The team was ugly. Right. And when I was and, going to those games. Right. And then, there were 30-win teams. And then when Larry came, I said it wasn't the good or the bad. It was great. For me, it was great. Because yeah. I thought before he got there, I, I, I might get a couple games in, but it's over. He made the game... With those, and with those other guys, those other additions, Kevin and, and Robert, Maxwell, you know, Gerald Henderson was on the team, ML Card. Larry made the game so much easier to play because all I had to do was pick and choose who I just had to pass the ball to. <laughs> okay, and, I, and like I said, Cedric Maxwell was my best right. friend, and, and he would come over there. Can I get a little... Yeah, little, give me some. Li- no, a little bit of leather. And I'm like, yeah, leather? Yeah. No, the ball leather. Man, <laughs> pass me the ball a couple of times. But it was just a great feeling to win and think that I have a chance. Yeah. You know, and and, 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 and it was great to win the championship. Well, yes, I, maybe we could have got a couple more. Hey, we should have won in 82. But, 82 is a better team. You know, sometimes the, 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 the shamrock is not with everybody. Yeah. Okay? It, it changed, and You're it right. went with the Sixers. Even though they shouldn't have won, they won, okay? And they shouldn't have won. I tell kids now, unfortunately, it's a team game. Yeah. Okay? When you get in the playoffs, it's a team game. So if one guy's not doing well, somebody else has to pick it up and bring it home to win. Well, I got to tell you this, and we got to wrap it up. Um, you ruined point guard for me for all the next point guards because <laughs> I'm like 10, 11, and 12 and watching you play. And you just like you just knew how to play point guard. You just knew like I, when to step back, when to, when your team needed you to go to the basket. I got to get this guy involved. I got to get like the way I watched you play affected the way I thought everybody else should play. And not everyone plays that way. Like you see, like there's shoot first point guards. There's guys that they got to get theirs. They got to get to their twenty. I, I don't know. I'm old school. I, I just feel like the point guards like he's got to be able to take over the last four minutes if you need him. But it's his job to give everybody else their their but, leather, as Max said. But, but, but I think that when 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 you look at point, so-called point guards now, and then even back then, everybody has a different identity. I guess when, when I when I came in, I wasn't a good shooter. I was getting fouled a lot, and yeah. not because I was shooting. You're going to land like 13 times a game. People were saying he's penetrating too much. I was getting bumped up and stuff like that, but it felt good to me because. I go back to how I played right. when I was growing up, and it was challenging to go to the basket. And then when I got into the league, I had to learn other elements to make my game better. Guys are saying, I'm backing up off this guy, because what? He's in, trying to embarrass me. Right. Okay? So I started perfecting a little jump shot. And then I was getting fouled a lot. I said, I got to be a better foul shooter. And I think that when you watch guys today, I look at LeBron. Carmelo, I see little, you know, tapes on those guys. They have improved in other areas yeah. to get longevity. And I tell guys, it's about longevity now. You could have done certain things when you first came in, like Michael. Michael was dunking on everybody when he first came in the league. Started shooting 15 footers, started moving further back. But then he started, like Larry, he started dissecting the game. I got a big guy. I can't post him up. He can't guard me out on the floor. I get a small guy, I'll pass to somebody. And he was, to me, not the point forward, but he was the vocal part of the team that he was with. Yeah. So the ball <laughs> filtrated and generated through him. Yeah. Like Larry. Larry became, when he came into the league, he was a forward. Somebody changed that. He became the point forward. And people said, well, what does that mean? He's the vocal part of where it starts and may- basically where it ends. Because great passer, and when he first came in the league, I said, can't jump, can't run. Man. Seeing him get, getting triple doubles. You don't have to be a great jumper to rebound. Well, remember the 82 team that back when he really had his wheels, they put him at two guard? Right. You were the backcourt, and then they played Mikhail Parrish and Maxwell as the forwards. Right. I mean, that's insane. That, that, that team, you guys won like 18 in a row at one point. I thought that team was great. We got to go. You got to be the, the king of New York for the weekend. This is great. 
Uh, it was a pleasure to finally meet you. Thanks for the 81 title. Uh, enjoy the weekend. And we're done with the BS report from uh, New York City All Star <laughs> Weekend. Thanks for watching. So I get to sign off. Whoa! Thank you for downloading the BS report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Geico presents Strange Savings Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance.